It is 5 p.m. and the Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting on Monday, July 18th, 2022. All commissioners are present, uh, as is Mike Sullivan and Beth Essery from the Electric Department. And I would ask the others who are here uh, just to identify themselves for the record, if you would please. Uh, Sean Enterline with Vermont Public Power Supply Authority. Heather Darcy with Vermont Public Power Supply Authority. Rory Jones with DeLorean Power. Joe Levitt with DeLorean Power. Thank you all for, for joining us. Um, are there any modifications uh, to the agenda? Um, one that I'm wondering about because I believe that Eric was going to be joining us and he's not here. Um, if we want to move that back on the agenda, have you heard anything, Mike? Is he? He, he just popped into the queue as you ah. said his name. Ah, Mike Magic. Okay. Yeah. Um, there he is. Hi, Eric. Hi. And so Eric Remick is also in attendance at the meeting. Um, in other business, I would like to add a brief discussion of uh, some of the items mentioned in Eli's email, which may be nothing more than a request for follow up on some of them. Okay. And, I... and talking about um, returning to regular sessions. And return, yes, yes, yes. And there's someone who isn't identified by name, an 802-812 number. Would you care to identify yourself? Yeah, hi, this is Mike Herbert from Gore and Power. I'm, uh, I am finishing up a drive right now. Are my other colleagues with you guys, Rory and we're Joe all, and Myra? They are. All yes. On. We're all on, Mike. And Myra just joined us as well. OK. OK. And, and, I, and I believe Eli Emerson is on the phone as well. OK. Um, the, the first item on the agenda, um, we have Eric Remick here um, from Hardwick Trails in his Hardwick Trails hat. Um, but uh, Eric is also the chair of our select board and uh, to talk about some issues in connection with Hardwick Trails. Um, so Eric, I turn it over to you. All right. Um, so basically why I'm here is, uh, is to give you a heads up that I may be requesting your assistance in the future. Um, so uh, quite a while ago, I think last fall, last summer, last fall sometime, um, I came to this board um, to say that the Hardwick Trails Committee would like to extend um, and add some single track trails north of Billings Road um, on that. It's approximately 300 acre parcel that also contains the gravel pit and now the H11 power um, installation. And uh, after some back and forth with Mike, we came to um, that probably the only uh, issue to overcome would be an Act 250 permit that's on that land because of the gravel pit. So uh, I went to our Act 250 district coordinator um, after some back and forth with her. Um, it appears that we need to do an Act 250 permit amendment for trails and she has been a little hard to reach. We've played phone tag and emails, but she's offered via voicemail to assist me with the application to make sure that I get it right. And I think it, it may be a little bit of a tricky situation because um, Hardwick Trails, I believe the first round of ski trails, well, like the 10K of ski trails was completed around 2003. So that predates the Act 250 permit. And yet there has been some activity since, and our Kirsten Sultan, our Act 250 district coordinator has been aware of some of this activity because she's had to sign off on a few things. But 
you know, I think just because of the timeline of the trails coming and then the Act 250 coming and then there are different uses and some of the property overlaps, but some of it doesn't. Anyway, it just never got set as a, the trails were never included as a anything in the Act 250 permit. So we're going to have to go through that. Um, and it's apparently a process. So just, just for clarification, Eric, so are those trails that are on the HED property or on town of Hardwick property or school district property or all of the above? So, I, so there, uh, the trails exist currently on three parcels. Um, the shepherds own land up on Bridgman Hill. So some of the, uh, you know, maybe a third of the trails are on the shepherds land, maybe a third are on the Hazen Union land, and maybe a third are on this town of Hardwick slash HED parcel. So, um, yeah, that's the property but situation. The, but the areas that are, that are, developable that have space you can use going forward is north of Billings Road, right? Correct, on the town Hardwick Electric property. So is the uh, November 1st to April 15th restriction going to apply to any, uh, any trail construction or? Um, construction, well, so probably. Oh, or use, yeah, sorry. Probably, yeah. So use and construction, I would guess. Um, there is, so before we knew we needed a permit amendment, um, Kirsten asked me to check in with uh, Agency of Natural Resources, a couple of people there, one about stream, stream crossings and that sort of thing. That person said, sounds fine. Your plans look good. Glad you're glad using you. bridges, not culverts, yada, yada. The other person she wanted me to check with is a um, deer wintering person who was very concerned about the, um, the deer wintering. And so I immediately said, yeah, we can, have, we can close these trails in the winter if that's, if that's an issue. And um, he stated that uh, it was a long email exchange and some phone conversation, but basically I, what I got from him was that he doesn't believe is good enough just to close the trails for the deer wintering period. Um, he kind of said, if you build it, they will come, people will use it. Uh, and yeah, so, so um, I think the approach we're gonna have to take is to hire our own um, expert to provide input with this application so that when it's reviewed, there isn't just this one person's point of view that there, you know, there's at least an additional point of view to suggest that Maybe there isn't all that much deer wintering habitat, habitat in there anyway. And, um, and if we close the trails in the winter, it seems like we've mitigated any problem. Okay. What, do you, what do you need, Eric, from Hardwick Electric? So I don't know yet. I just wanted to get on your agenda to get on your radar and let you know, I need to start working on this application. I'm assuming, having not gotten into it yet, that I'm gonna need concurrence or participation somehow from Hardwick Electric, from the town, probably from Hazen, um, I don't know. So I'm just giving you the heads up that this is what's happening. We thought we could build some, you know, foot wide single track trail through the woods and it's turned into a circus. Uh, let us know how we can help. You know, that's, um, if. Thank you. Know, you. What, what? I don't know yet, but. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yeah. If, if you wait to 2028, then you don't have to worry about it. So that has come to my mind, like, <laughs> because like the Tom Fadden has said that there's not going to be more uh, gravel to extract there. The permit's going to expire. Um, and we may run out of gravel before the permit expires, in which case we could request to have the permit expired early. So that's a possible uh, way to, to move forward as well. How would, so, that help? How would that help? Because as soon as the Act 250 permit, so most Act 250 permits in Vermont run with the land forever. 
That's not true for earth extraction permits, they expire. And so once the parcel is out of Act 250, then this whole discussion is moot because um, we wouldn't be creating enough of a disturbance or development in order to trigger an Act 250 permit on our own. Right. The, only, the only reason we have to do it is because there is an Act 250 permit for the gravel pit. I see. So it doesn't, I, I, I didn't realize it didn't run with the land. So yeah, it's a strange, uh, just anomaly. It's the only type of Act 250 permit that expires. How much gravel, Mike, do you know how much, or, or Eric, how much gravel is left? My understanding in my last conversation with Tom, which was at least a year ago, uh, was that he, that this year and by the end of next year, he expected what was in there for usable gravel would be expired. I've heard him throw out two or three years. Yeah. Uh, so fairly soon. So yeah, it may be more efficient just to wait a couple of years, um, which is hard. And this is you don't know what might replace it. You know, we, we, could, we could get something even better. Right, <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, but I have to have this conversation with Kirsten Sultan, our Act 250 district coordinator. I wasn't able to reach her today um, or, you know, the last months. <laughs> and just so the board knows, the, the area that Eric is talking about was um, that whole area east of the H11 and up to the waterway maybe at the north end of the H11 project, that whole hillside was uh, specifically avoided with Dave Mitchell and our plan to move the mitigation area, which Eli is working on slowly but surely. Um, so the area Eric's talking about, we've, we've made plans for them and should be in a good position. You should all be in a good position to support cargo trails and what they wanna do in there. I love the trails. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. So do I. <laughs> all right. So that's all I have. Thank you for your uh, words of support. And I'll be, I'll come back with more info when I have it. And in the meantime, I'll put myself on mute and hang on as long as I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sean, I think you were going to give us a, uh, an update on purchase power? Sure, uh, I've got my colleague Heather here too. She'll cover the renewable energy credits portion of it. Uh, may I share screens? I've got a few slides yes. that uh, have been updated since the VEPS board meeting. They're the same slides. I just put in the freshest numbers I could this afternoon. All right. Um, so I've got a couple different uh, and short slide decks. This one's just got five slides, including what you're looking at here, and, and then a couple more, depending on how the conversation goes. So I want to give you a look at natural gas, which is the underlying fuel that is driving our electricity prices in New England, and then end with the May to year-to-date budget to actuals. We're right on the cusp of having June right now, but didn't quite get done in time for this meeting. Um, it's a busy chart here. This is a picture of natural gas prices over the past uh, year. Um, right when we were doing budgets last early fall, we went experienced this run up on the left. And that was when liquefied natural <laughs> gas started leaving Texas and Louisiana in large quantities. Um, we had this dip through the early winter here. And then it's just kind of been off to the races ever since with the war in Ukraine. And the bottom line is, Europe and Asia are paying about $50 per unit of gas that we're paying about seven to $9 for. So depending on the moment in time in this volatile market you're looking at, there's a four to six fold difference in price to attract those ships. That is important to New England because we try to attract those very same ships during the winter time when it's cold here. So our winter time pricing, unfortunately in this final bullet is $300 per megawatt hour around the clock. That's a record. That's uh, 
not been seen before. So that's different than the 242 you had. Yes. Uh, if you rewind it two weeks, which was the lead up time to the VEPSA board meeting, that same number was 242. <laughs> how, how, how much uh, I noticed the same difference. <laughs> That's a huge difference in, uh, in two weeks. Um, I, I mean, is, are, are we, are we now going vertical or, or is, or is it just uh, part of the volatility and, and what's, what are your thoughts on that? This is the most volatile uh, period of time since the beginning of my career, Lynn. I started in 1998, and then I went to work for Pacific Gas and Electric in 2000, which was uh, not good timing. It was California energy crisis days. So, um, you know, it's been three phases of my career now where I've seen this. Once was at the beginning. Uh, once was back in the three years leading up to 2008. We had a very volatile high price period then. Um, and then now, so yeah, it is just baked into the volatility of the market. Uh, from a price perspective, this is still within bounds. Uh, I would say prices are doing their job, markets are doing their job, but it doesn't make it less painful financially. It is uh, quite a ride, even recently. I mean, we spiked up to $9 just in June, dropped down to below six, and now we're back up to seven fifty. It's just wild. Um, this is what it looks like over the very long term. If you'll go all the way back to 2004, we we're on this price trend. And I've showed you this chart a few times in the past. Uh, we bottomed out in this long-term trend during the pandemic and early 2000. You might recall there was a period of time there where oil prices were negative. People were getting paid <laughs> uh, uh, to export oil. It was fascinating. But anyway, this the war in Ukraine combined with this economic shift post-COVID is really driving this. And uh, it's worse than 2023, as you can see here, but it's very likely to persist for a few years after. So th this doesn't really reflect any like rapid integration of renewables. No, what's on the horizon is uh, offshore wind for New England. And 18 months ago, maybe two years ago at this point, we were thinking the mid 2020s would be the implementation date. And you'd see these wintertime spikes get suppressed because you've got a thousand megawatts of wind offshore. Uh, just like everything else in the economy, uh, supply chains have slowed those projects down and uh, they are no longer expected by 2025, six. It's out a year or two at this point. So late in the decade, later than this chart shows. Uh, this is just kind of a zoom in on prices. It's the same chart, but much shorter period of time. So I'm cherry picking here. Please be aware. I'm trying to illustrate a point. We reached the bottom of the price curve over a decadal period back in 2020, so when the pandemic started. So that's as low as it ever got. That's abnormally low. And this past January, we spiked to 150 with very much the same price dynamics as we're facing now. We just didn't have the war yet. And since the war started, we're up here in these red lines. The budget that I give you every fall includes a five-year forecast. And so this bottom solid line here in the yellow box is what the uh, the budget was foreseeing uh, last fall for you. So things have changed even dramatically since uh, last November, December. And for you, we made some tweaks in January, as I recall, Mike, uh, yep. to the budget. So these prices are, back to your question, Lynn, they're kind of unhooked, at least in the winter, you know, very volatile and very high. So uh, how much of this, how much of this is, what percentage of the total energy purchase budget uh, are are the day ahead uh, costs? I mean, how much is this going to increase? I mean, just you know, an estimate increase over the next couple of years that, until the contracts run out. Yeah. So uh, on an annualized average, your hedge ratio is is about ninety eight, ninety nine percent. Unfortunately, in January, it's about ninety percent. Might have been eighty five this past January because it was cold and we had higher loads. 
yeah so it's just on, it was just under 90 yep yep you know that go ahead no i guess for me the question is that delta over the winter what does that do to our expenses and vis-a-vis -vis our budget um well, you've already experienced that, Lynn. The, to, if we could jump ahead, for instance, to the uh, May year-to-date financials, you know, we experienced a January where prices spiked here to $150, and your hedge ratio was, you know, like Mike said, in that 90% range. So that month, let's just look at it because I have it up here. I was anticipating the question. Um, forgive me. I know this is a lot of numbers, but that's okay. you, uh, are an audience that don't doesn't mind it. So yeah, Mike is spot on. Uh, Ninety percent coverage ratio. You were over budget by twenty five percent in January. That was ninety five thousand dollars, ninety six thousand yeah. dollars. So that's a pretty. So this and so at three hundred dollars, then could we just double that as our potential exposure? If we did nothing going forward, yes. Yep. So that's kind of, and is it only truly one month or is it lead, you know, is it part of December, part of February, or is it really constant trade? <laughs> Great question. Yeah, the uh, the way this trades, January, February are basically mirrors of each other. So it's that, it's that two month period. December mm -hmm. prices very high, but not quite that high. Um, and then it's up to the up to Mother Nature and Old Man Winter specifically. If we actually did get a cold winter and natural gas storage ran low, March can be scary too. That that's pretty rare, but it's and it's it's not so much. It's, there's two factors there: is how much do we need to buy, which is a function of the weather and our usage, and then it's at what cost. And the yeah. average cost depends on many external factors, right now. Yeah, and it's um. A difficult set of, I wish I had a better adjective. You know the game. It's buy low, sell high when you deal with markets like this. So if you were to buy $300 power today and prices went up, you'd be smiling. If you bought that same $300 power today and prices went down, you actually cost yourself even more money. So, sure. um, oh, it's a, oh, sorry. I do have some hedge yeah. options here for you all. To yeah, look let's, at. let's look at them. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Go ahead, Vince. I didn't mean to talk over oh, you. Sorry. Oh, hold on. Uh, there. Got to get rid of that scam likely. Um, so a couple of related questions. One, is it uh, is the, uh, the low coverage ratio consistent every January, every January? And if so, it's still, uh, we're, we're talking about a substantial amount of capacity but it's enough that some type of storage uh, could uh, substantially offset. I mean, I, it depends on how much of, of it is associated with transmission costs too. But I mean, this, uh, this, is, this is mostly a capacity driven cost. No, uh, no this is an energy cost. This energy. is natural gas. This is, this is the gas cost, Vince. Uh, right, right, right. But what I'm talking about, right. I'm talking about the generation of the electricity. It's, it, that's what, no, yeah. no, the cost, the, the reason the spike is being caused by fuel prices, not by capital costs. No, I, okay. When I say capital costs, what I mean is, it, yeah, I didn't say capital, I said capacity, the actual purchase of energy as opposed to. Okay, that's, the, yeah, that's not what, that's not capacity. Go ahead. Okay, but so, okay, I guess that was leading to uh, if it's anticipatable. So actually, I just, I guess I just, Sorry, you said you had some hedging strategies, so. Yeah, we've put half a dozen choices in front of uh, the VEPSA board to consider. I'm gonna have a short list for them uh, here in early August to really choose from. And when I say choose, it means go ahead and go to the individual utilities and their uh, electric commission and trustees to ask for approvals. But yeah, I, I can show you that uh, slide. Um, I think I only got one more slide in this series. This is so a one other one other thing, Sean. Could you go over the um, so coming into January, the day ahead or week ahead or month ahead market, when you guys were anticipating 
or or prices were going at exorbitant rates and you and Ken and the team decided we're not going there. We're going to roll the dice and see where we land. Can you talk about that strategy and where we landed as compared to what it would have been if we had purchased ahead? Sure, Mike. Um, so it's the week before Christmas, 2021, and we're experiencing crazy volatility and we're faced with our hedge policy and our hedge policy just says before each operating month, we got to get your coverage ratio to the best of our ability between plus or minus 5% of a hundred. That's our job. And knowing how pricey things were and how weather dependent this was, we chose the low end of that range. So that's what you're remembering, Mike. We chose 95% uh, rather than hundred or 105 to target you for. And so we bought power at $260 and change uh, that week before Christmas, as I've showed you earlier, the, you know, prices only, got, only, only got up to $150 that month. So it was a money losing purchase. Um, but that last 5% of your um, supply actually came straight from the day ahead market at 150 bucks. So partial win, partial loss is a little bit of a mixed bag there. But just to carry that story forward, uh, Lewis Porter at Washington Electric Cooperative, he's the new uh, general manager there that uh, succeeded Patty Richards. He was cutting his teeth and trying hard to figure out what to do. And he made a decision a little bit later, like, gosh, I don't remember what it was, Heather, days, it wasn't weeks. And he ended up buying power at, I don't know, 210, 220, substantial discount. Still didn't look good, but just a couple of days difference, you know, made a 20% change in the in the price that he paid. And he was better off uh, by that margin than, than the rest of the BEPSA members. But fast forward another month, it's January, 2020, coming up on February, late in the month. We've already experienced these high prices. We're looking at February. Ken Nolan is a very consistent man and manager. He made the same choice for February that he had subsequently made or previously made for uh, January. He bought to that 95% level in February. And I don't remember the prices anymore, but I do remember what Lewis Porter did at WEC. He rolled the dice. <laughs> he didn't buy a thing. And as you can see here, February prices fell right off. Um, they were still over a hundred bucks, but they weren't going up. You know, so <laughs> that's, that's a decision you, you have to make with your board and somewhat in advance. You got to be comfortable as a group knowing what those uh, outcomes are. Um, so anyway, th I think this is a good lead in to just show you what the cohort looks like. This is uh, the core VEPSA membership. It doesn't include WEC. It doesn't include our, our Maine and New Hampshire um, utilities. But Hardwick's highlighted in yellow there. And on a year-to-date basis, you look really good. You're right in there with plus or minus 1% with load. Your hydro generation's right where you'd want it. Coverage ratio is excellent. But that dollar variance is substantial. And it's not just you. Um, your colleagues are all there for much the same reason. Swanton's always an exception, of course. But um, there's a lot going on. And, and when these markets are volatile, you get mismatches between supply and demand, both hourly and, and sometimes monthly. And that's what drove the variance this year. Now, I will say you're likely to do a little bit better through the summer for two reasons. You yep. just build H11. That means you have a hedge ratio that's greater than 100% through the summer months. You've got a little bit more power than you need, and you're selling it into a very high market. Uh, summer prices are higher than budget. So we're kind of creeping back each month as we go toward, I, I don't want to use the word par because you're not going to reach par with budget at this point. That's not going to happen in my opinion, but uh, that 10% may creep down a little bit more over the coming months. So that's 10% over budget. Yeah, and just on the power supply budget, you've got a whole yeah. other side of the books, of course. And what does the rate variance mean there? The that is the $168,000 variance uh, divided by your load. So I've expressed yeah. load in a percentage here, but if you divide it by megawatt hours, you can get a, a percentage change of it. So what that means is you've um, sold 1% less power than we expected. And so that rate variance is 1% more. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, so what do we do about this? Um, let's take a look at those slides. So running, I ran the numbers back, I don't know, a couple of months ago. And performance wise, the last couple of years, like you said, Sean, we're coming into our best performing months. And now we have VH11 in our equation. So my rough numbers were that we should be able to hit 5% over budget, maybe a little less, which is not as scary a number as, you know, what it looked like in January and February. So I think we're going to be okay is my overall message. Yes, we're over budget, but it's not going to be horrible. What does is, what is that do to our cash flow? How does, how does that look? That. You're muted. I can get that information for you, but I don't have that readily available. But I, I'll, I can get that for you. Any any sense of proportion? I mean, to me, that's yeah. the real that's the real concern because if we're not going to have enough cash, then we need to be thinking about uh, yeah. making sure, finding a way to make sure that we do either by cutting so Lynn, expenses or. So Lynn, I um I looked pretty carefully at the statements last month and this month with respect mm -hmm. to cash flow, and um, we took an alarming bite in April out of our cash balance but it wasn't really an operating issue as more of a timing issue as it turned out because right. May, the Correct. timing term, we still had negative cash flow in May and, and we're, but we're still negative for the year to date. Um, so we're burning through our cash reserve, but not at the alarming rate of April. And, Correct. and I think we're going to need Beth and Mike to give us a, a, a real projection, but what I can do, I can tell you and the rest of the board that we, on the one hand, we're comfortable given our large amount of cash. However, and this is the big however, is it really what we want to do as a board to burn through this cash pile, basically sub having really negative operating performance and subsidizing with our cash reserve um, our rates? And I think that's a dangerous policy because you pay the piper eventually it is only going to work for a little while so your pile of cash is gone and then you've you've eliminated your cushion you've eliminated your flexibility on projects and you've really adopted a posture so the good news is we're not going to run out of cash and i think we need beth and mike to confirm that but my view at a high level is we're not going to run out of cash the bad news is we're burning through it and that's not a good policy in my view i think we should we need to figure out how to get our, our 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 rates in line with our costs on some schedule, so we don't just burn through our pile of cash. Yeah, that's so a last, personal point of view. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's legit. But the yes. one thing I will share is a little bit of detail on that painful number you looked at last month for money that went out, and and the I believe it was like two hundred and forty-eight thousand dollars. Roger, if I'm right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but when you go through the detail on that, which was one of our follow-ups from last month's meeting, um, 125 of that was property taxes we had to pay. So that's an annual hit we take in that month. And 60,000 of it was for distribution transformers, which I overbought because the supply chain is terrible. Um, but those that was $185,000 of that. Good. 246. So the number is much better than what yeah. that report showed. Yeah. Yeah, but, that's, but that's, but you've just illustrated why it's important to have a forecast, to have yep. a cash flow yeah. forecast yep. factors those things in because they were, they're payments that were made earlier, perhaps. But I think we need that forecast. And I think we need to have a discussion about what is an appropriate cushion that we need to maintain. Um, and, and then to the take a very hard look as to whether that can be done with more restraint on expenses or or whether we need to be having a serious discussion about um, a rate increase. Hey Michael, when does uh, Center Road come on online? Center Road's been on for about uh, eight weeks, but that's not a 
there's no direct benefit to us other than the revenues we gain from the partnership of Encore and VEPSA on that being a speed project. So and, we and end up so that we end up with about yeah. twenty five thousand dollars a right. year from those projects through VEPSA. Is is there a transmission tariff on any of their supply? There is a tariff on their wheeling through our system in the works. It is not in place right now, but Steve Fireman has that and is working something up for us. I seem to remember that was end up being a substantial amount, which would, could significantly offset any yes. negative cash flow. Yes. Is that agreement just between us and them, or do we have to get some government agency involved with it? That will be an actual wheeling distribution wheeling tariff that will need to be approved by the PUC. Okay. How long does that usually take? Uh, not as long. It's not a huge item. Um, Vermont Electric Co-op has one. So there's a model in place that's already been approved. Uh, VEPSA drafted up a model several years ago for Enosburg when they were looking at some speed projects coming in. So a lot of the groundwork uh, has already been done. Steve just needs to get it out, dust it off, and fine tune it for hardwood. So I would say maybe uh, late summer, early fall, he'll have something to share with us. Okay. And what, what is the, the process? I mean, is there, uh, you have to present a, a reasonable tariff, a reasonable rate to the PUC to which the other party has to agree? Or is there any negotiation involved or how does that work? Eli's on the, why don't we let Eli answer that? He's on. Yeah, it would be, uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah it would be, it would be the same structure as a retail rate filing. Um, the PUC really does not have a lot of experience with wheeling tariffs, just because most of the um, wheeling tariffs in the state of Vermont are FERC jurisdictional. I know we worked on one for Swanton a long time ago related to Project 10, but it's essentially the same process. Uh, you need to file it uh, 45 days in advance of it going into an effect the department would weigh in with a recommendation on whether to investigate or not. Um, and then the PUC would make a decision whether it wanted to investigate or not. The, because you guys are a municipal utility, um, you would have the option of putting it in place subject to having to rebate back the money if the PUC ultimately determined that your rate was uh, either too high or they didn't approve it at all. So that is like a threshold question that you guys can decide if you want the rate to go into effect after 45 days, even if the PUC may approve something lower, but basically just like a retail rate filing would go. And, and the, the rate would start at the, uh, uh, at the approval of the, of the tariff. It wouldn't be retroactive to. No, no. If, if we didn't opt, Eli, I believe, do you understand? If we don't opt to put it into effect after the 45 days, it's not retroactive for when, from when we get a decision. Correct. You're either, Correct. you make a decision to implement it after 45 days, and then you just take the risk. You'll have to rebate back some money that you may have overcharged, or you don't want to take that risk and you just decide to wait until the PUC issues a final decision, you know, which probably could take three to six months, depending on if there's any opposition to the to the filing. So you could weigh the potential cost fifteen to thirty thousand dollars in return fees or, or or you know approximate depending on what it is. Yeah, exactly. It's it's really just it's an option that they give to munis and co-ops so that you don't have to wait till the end of a rate case, case to start getting some of the cash. You just really do take the risk that they may approve um, something lower than you've been charging and you have to give some of that money back. So there's already a structure and, a, and an equation uh, in place with the VEC tariff that we will use for a model and just put in our uh, capacity costs and crank those numbers out. So the model of 
you know, okay, Public Utility Commission, we want to do it this way. What do you think? It's already been built. So it shouldn't be a huge complicated process. Eli, you're relatively familiar with that piece, right? With the co-op tariff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, they're all they're all essentially based on um, federal tariffs that are similarly structured. So yes, definitely familiar. Okay. So, so if I can s summarize, the takeaway is that we'd like a cash flow forecast um, from uh, Mike and Beth, and that we all need to think about what an appropriate cushion is. Anything else on, on purchase power? Well, I, I think there is here. We kind of got sidetracked unless my brain phased out for a minute. And that is, we need to hear from Sean what our options are. That's right. Yeah, we, we're heading. coming back. So, so I think like we need to get back to that because that's our immediate Question Thank you, Rod. Of, yeah, what can we what can we do about what's coming at us? So um, right now we've got a half dozen options here. They're listed at the bottom of this first slide. Uh, oh, they're just an alphabetical border. I'll talk through them briefly. Uh, Brookfield is a uh, seller of hydropower in our region. Uh, you might remember we bought power from them about two years ago, specifically to replace part of the next era contract that is expiring from Seabrook here. So we could choose to buy more and kind of blend it in and average out the pricing. They sold to us for kind of low $40 per megawatt hour. If you were buying uh, 2023, for instance, that's about $100 megawatt hour presently across the year. You know, you'd average those two and end up with a, you know, 70 ish dollar contract. So uh, that's an option. And you can play that game both in one year with 2023, or you can spread it out over 24, 25, when those prices start to moderate a little. Um, McNeil has been brought up. Uh, that's the wood-fired power plant in Burlington that uh, Burlington Electric owns 50% of, but BEPSA is also a joint owner of it. Um, the nice thing about McNeil is we know it, we could buy wintertime only power. You wouldn't have to buy it for a whole year. Um, but Burlington Electric's uh, position in terms of selling it to us is that it definitely be unit contingent um, and it would definitely be around the clock. They're not interested in selling daytime power to us only. And so um, anyway, it's not a perfect fit, but it's definitely a legitimate uh, choice. Burlington's not yet offered us any pricing. Uh, it would be at a discount to market because of the unit contingency. Um, so anyway, we're going to get a price on that to be included in the next version of this deck. I'll have to start going to executive session when we start talking price uh, this next month, but it'll be some discount to the market as it is. Next era would be happy to do what Brookfield would do. You know, they'll sell us more power out of Seabrook, but it's going to be at market prices. There'll be no discount there. Uh, what might be the most interesting option is this fourth one, New York ISO Wind. There is a uh, project in the central New York area, they call it Zone C, that uh, is uncommitted and is looking to get a medium to long-term contract in place to sell its power. Um, there's a company named Tenasca, it's just a Texas-based power marketer that has offered to step into the middle and say, hey, wind owner, I'll buy your power on a PPA. And then they're turning around to VEPSA and maybe some other counterparties in New England because we're not big enough to buy it all and say, hey, we'll, we'll sell the power to you uh, and they'll take care of the transmission and they'll absorb the uh, pricing risk to get it from New York to New England. Um, the indicative pricing is at a pretty steep discount for a five, 10 year period. It's $80. That looks incredible right now. You're not going to be unhappy with that price in 2023. The real question is how are you going to feel in 2025? or seven, <laughs> you know, you're going to look back and that long, long-term average is actually closer to 40, 50 bucks. So it's uh, a matter of your view of the market and how long you want to get committed to power like this. The reason I like it, and I think the reason Ken Nolan likes it, is it's diversifying. We do not have any wind in our portfolio. It happens to peak in its production profile in the winter, which is when we need it, need it most. Um, 
Does and Tenasca is a good credit risk. Uh, they're a well-established company. Uh, I wouldn't have any problem signing a PPA with them from a performance. Does guarantee. that include, include the Rex? Uh, yes, that's the other benefit. It comes oh. with, uh, thank you for bringing that up. It comes with Rex. And that's a, that's 10 bucks less than Billings. Uh, it could be as much as 35 bucks less. These are class one Rex by Massachusetts standards. It's a Massachusetts class one. So we would most likely sell it and take that $35 back in as cash and spend it out to get the Vermont tier one we need. So at, at, at this rate, uh, do you have any idea how it would affect our uh, power purchase budget? I mean, that's a substantial percentage of the total power purchase. <laughs> yeah, that's the question that I am uh, in the midst of answering. I've got a meeting with Ken on Friday to peel that back at the BEPSA level, uh, not at every individual utility level yet. But yeah, when I come, let's assume for a moment, I don't know if this is going to be the case because I haven't seen everybody's price, but let's assume this wind import turns out to be uh, what the VEPSA board would like to take back to its membership. I would come back to you with exactly that, Vince, uh, in late August and say, hey, here's Hardwick specific volumes. And at this $80, what the impact is on your budget. I mean, I get that, that could be huge in just stabilizing the, the rate. Yeah, with one caveat, well, two caveats, just like McNeil, this is going to be unit contingent, but because it's not in region, it's also going to be transmission contingent. There will be hours, and they're probably going to be those cold hours in January on a day where the transmission will get prorated. Okay, not. so that would be part of the tariff. It's not delivered, uh, I mean, it's not delivered all inclusive. Hey, can of can I make a suggestion, Vince? Yeah. You're, you're, you're showing great energy of peppering him with questions, but I'd really like to hear his proposal and let him make his presentation and get the information in sure. front of us because yeah. okay. you're creating so many distractions and I can't even follow it. Okay, I well, hear, I, hear I don't what need you're to be distracting, Roger. I, that's not my intent. Yeah, it's all good questions. So I'll, I'll jump to the chase. So two more options. We can always buy market power on a must-take contract. That's his fifth option. I would recommend if you went that direction to buy at least a couple of years, maybe three, to average out the price. Um, the benefit of that is it's discoverable and it's known and measurable in a rate case. If you did get into a position where you want to go for a rate case, now you've got a contract with these high prices there to kind of justify the increase that you want. Um, but you're not locked in long term. You know, it'll come off in 2025 or six, depending on the length. And by then, I would expect the uh, world to settle down a little bit, at least with respect to energy pricing. Uh, very briefly, Project 10, uh, most of the VEPSA membership owns a little bit of this oil fired peaker in Swanton. Um, we presently monetize it in the reserve market. That is code for saying it doesn't run for energy purposes, but we could change that. We could take one of the jets out of the reserve market and use it to hedge energy. Um, that's an excellent way to avoid $1,000 prices. It's a pretty mediocre up to useless way to avoid $300 prices uh, because it's a very inefficient unit burning a very expensive fuel. So I don't actually think we're gonna land there. So yeah, what's the short list? I think the short list is this NISO wind and McNeil option and followed by Brookfield. Uh, you know, you're not going to get any discounts out of Brookfield, but you have the opportunity to kind of blend in the pricing and uh, do that. I summarized it uh, this way. You're going to pay market for everything. You can't escape the market. But if you're willing to take on some risk, unit contingent in the case of McNeil, transmission and unit contingent in the case of New York Wind, you will get some discount the market. And that's probably what we're going to uh bring back to you in a month, some combination of those two. What, what does that mean in dollars? Does that mean when you say market, is market $300? In January it is, yep. So it's, 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 a, um, it's a variable price. It's not a, it's not a fixed price over the term. Yeah, Burlington Electric, as I understand it, Lynn, is actually asking for a fixed price. Uh, it's just going to change by month, uh, the day you enter the contract. So if we entered the contract today, they'd be expecting $300 minus some discount in January. 
Uh, the July pricing is probably, you know, $80 or something like that. We get a discount off of $80, but it would be a fixed price. And, and what's, So Tenasca's got 50,000 megawatt hours for on the on this NISA wind. What's the timing on that? Because you were talking about coming back to us late August. Late August is not when we have a meeting. Um, oh, so, so let's I, assume that happens. Yeah, so Tenasca's I just want to like, make sure that we don't miss an opportunity because we're at the sink. Yeah, no, that's... Uh, Unlikely. The fastest things could move is we go to the VEPSA board and they kind of settle on this New York wind concept. Then I need a week or two to draft 11 letters to our 11 VEPSA members. And those letters will spell out, here's your specific volume for a specific term. It's an offer letter. And then I would bring that to you along with your impact on budget and a subsequent meeting. Uh, I would expect that to be the September meeting. Give your first look at it. Um, and just given the speed and lean lead times here, it's always been my... Uh, hope it's kind of a project manager to get this done before the winter hits us so decision time by october but is that gonna, is that going to meet tenasca's timing or are they are they going to be looking to offload this faster no i don't think they've so most of new england is retail competitive they don't have a lot of great muni clients <laughs> to, okay. to sell this to cool. at least they haven't disclosed it to me i think the massachusetts guys are already bought into hydro and I think we do have the months and we have well, a few what, months here. What was the caveat regarding uh, the Tenasca power, the transmission caveat? Yeah, primarily. I mean, okay, so that would be part of the tariff. So it wouldn't be guaranteed at 80. It would be also tariff dependent clause or something. Yeah, there's volume risk. The price is known, okay. will be known, but the delivery volume will be unknown. Okay, uh, okay. Yeah, it's kind of like a cat, Vince. You'd get up to... 50,000 megawatt hours a year subject to transmission availability. All right. We had at one time been talking about extending the next year contract by more than just a couple of years um, and going a longer term contract as we had had in the past. And I guess a question that I have is that if we were to do that, would I would guess there might be more favorable pricing uh, and I don't know how much more favorable, but is that something that VEPSA is looking at? Yeah, we're in touch with NextAir all the time. They're coming up to the New England Public Power Association conference in Stowe next month, for instance. So, uh, you know, I, I just have no expectation. You know, these big companies, it's such a transparent market. They're going to functionally offer us the same price, plus or minus a bid ass spread. You know, it's, uh, I don't view them differently, which is what I'm trying to get across here with this table is the difference between a next era Brookfield and the market contract is negligible to me. Okay. Could, can you send us those slides? Cause I think we had, mm -hmm. we didn't have the updated slides, but we had similar ones, but we didn't have the, these, the, the hedging options part. And that would be helpful to have. Yeah. There's more detail in there. If you cap into want to dig into it yeah um mike i'll send it back to you heather's available if you want to touch rex i want to leave lots of time for uh, the storage discussion as well any other questions for sean if not um sean thank you very much this is very helpful and um Thanks. Rory, um, I think we would uh, like to hear your presentation. Okay, so I <clears throat> I was talking to Sean just before the meeting oh. and asked him to work in a rec update for us, our tier one, tier two, tier uh, three okay. stuff. That's why Heather joined us. Um, we Sorry. are running behind schedule. So Heather, maybe you could join us next month. I think that would be fine but it is information I'd like to get to the board and to me too, and Beth. Yeah, I mean, I have a just a very quick uh, update if, you, if you'd like for tier one and two, um, but otherwise I can, I can certainly wait until next month. It's up to Lynn. It's not just up to me. It's um, how long is it? 
Why don't, why don't five basically, minutes? So basically very brief for res compliance 2021, um, Hardwick is in a bit of a deficit. So um, you're gonna have to pay about eleven eleven thousand five hundred dollars to you know internally within Vepsa to get enough recs to comply for tier one. Thanks to Billings Road, um, you are in excess uh, for tier two, so you can sell that internally. That's about forty thousand is going to be about forty thousand dollars net. It's about twenty nine thousand um, dollars to Hardwick. So um, you know, not a huge amount, but certainly is better than a sharp stick in the eye given <laughs> given uh, power supply costs so so heather does that um that sell include us banking any of the tier two into tier three for later use or not? um so i don't have tier three numbers yet but um yes you will be still have excess for even um compliance Perfect. next year and that doesn't even include what is generating for 2022 so you're in very good shape there so rec wise as of this summer and going forward we're in a pretty strong position yes very very strong position um for tier two which is the more expensive um on a per rec basis so Thank you for letting me speak. I am more than happy to come back next month as well. Thank you. Yep, that was great. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. Heather. Okay. Um, I'd like to turn the floor over to DeLorean. I'm not sure how folks want to do this, but welcome. And we look forward to hearing what you have to tell us. Great. Thanks, Lynn. Um, I could try to share my screen as well. Uh, I've got. Uh, I've got. Hey, to I just made your co-host. You should be able to do it now. Okay. 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 So you guys. I'm having a little see. trouble hearing you, Rory. Uh, okay, I'll just speak up a bit. Is that better? That's a lot better. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm speaking on my laptop. Usually I have the headphones in. So uh, hopefully you guys can see the PDF I've got up on my screen here. Yeah? Nope. Nope. Hmm. Can you see anything? See? Yeah, we Looks can like see you. Squares. <laughs> Let's try again. How about now? Yes. Yes. Great. And I'm going to try to do full screen mode. Does that expand the screen for you all, or is it just me? Just you. Just you. Hmm. But it's clear. It's fine. Okay. Um, this is this is the same one you sent, Mike. Looks like it's the same presentation. If you guys got a preview of it, uh, then maybe I can spend a little bit less time. But we'll walk through the slides here. So uh, we are. DeLorean Power, you've got uh, four of us on the line here. Um, you've got myself, Rory Jones, uh, Mike Herbert, we're the founders of the company. And you've also got Joe Levitt on the line, who uh, hails from your neck of the woods and is our director of engineering and construction. Uh, and you have Myra Sinat, and uh, Myra is a senior developer on our team with, uh, well, a heck of a lot of experience also in the, the interconnection realm, but um, but she has recently joined the team and is uh, based out of Maine, so uh, not local, but not too, too far away. Our headquarters are down in um, the DC metro area in Roslyn, uh, but we uh, we also have an office in, in Burlington and um, we are very active around the state of Vermont. So uh, without further ado, this is a, one of our projects getting loaded up and uh, sent to site. This is actually our battery uh, being sent to um, to Danville, Virginia. Um, so very quickly, we'll give an overview of the company. Uh, we'll speak to the merits of battery energy storage. Sounds like many of you are, are probably already familiar. So 
uh, won't harp on it too long, uh, give you some examples of the stuff we're doing elsewhere, and then speak to our partnership with VEPSA. And then finally, uh, we have taken a look at um, the Hardwick system and uh, just taken an initial pass on uh, what we think is an appropriate size battery system to kind of optimize the, the value that it can convey to, to Hardwick Electric. Um, company's leadership, myself, Mike, and a gentleman named Glenn Davis, who's been in the industry for many years. Mike has a, a background at FERC prior to launching the company with me. I have a, a background in finance. I was at the World Bank for many years, focusing on uh, renewable energy project finance. And uh, Glenn is uh, a very seasoned veteran of the industry, having uh, started a solar company, having been director of uh, what was then the largest energy storage company in the U.S., uh, built, oversaw the first utility-scale energy storage project in the U.S. Uh, back, uh, I don't know, I guess seven, eight years ago now, uh, out in Illinois. Um, and our team is, uh, we're, we're small but nimble. We're growing fast. Uh, we're, our headcount is at about 10 now, um, but we're, uh, we're ramping up our activities. We're a few years old, founded in 2019. Um, in the world of energy storage that is not uh, exceptionally youthful. Um, and as we will speak to, we've got you know, some of our first projects coming online here. These projects take a few years uh, sometimes to get uh, operational. And uh, our, our first project to be operational uh, in about a month's time will be uh, the largest project to date in, in Virginia, which has a very large storage mandate. So, um, you know, we're young, we're small, but relatively speaking, uh, we're, we're a pretty seasoned company. Um, our focus is not to just build massive batteries, uh, connect them to the transmission system and um, you know, sign long-term contracts. We look to uh, figure out the best way to deploy the flexibility of energy storage and do it at scale. So, you know, what's that level of uh, investment that makes the scale economy start to kick in, but it still allows us to kind of localize the siting of the energy storage resource. It's not in someone's home, uh, it's sitting next to a substation or it's on a distribution line, but it's still quite large and it's able to participate in wholesale markets. It's able to provide backup power to critical infrastructure. Um, it's able to do any of these many generation transmission distribution and customer services that you see on this matrix. Um, depending on the duration of the battery, uh, you, you may be able to do more or less things. The longer the duration of the battery, uh, the more expensive the battery will be. So there's some sweet spot where you're doing the most you can with what you've got, keeping the capital investment down while trying to push into uh, what you see here as uh, quote unquote long duration. Um, the definition of long duration can vary greatly, uh, but for these purposes, let's say that uh, it's a battery of two to three hours at least. Um, peak shaving is the focus of what we are doing with EPSA, uh, what we have set out to do with any member utilities um, in the VEPSA membership that has interest. And then where we can do other things as well, uh, the project might get a little bit more interesting and, and add a little bit more value. Um, frequency regulation is one thing that we can do with the battery in addition to the priority service of peak shaving to VEPSA and VEPSA members uh, that can bring the, the cost of that peak shaving activity down if we own this additional uh, activity of the battery, we take the risk that comes along with it. You're talking about uh, in, in Sean's very interesting presentation, the hedging risk, uh, not a lot of utilities that we work with want to own the speculative nature of uh, how the frequency regulation market will behave over the course of 20 years. Um, and that's how long our batteries last. Uh, so that's something we own, and we take the value of that and pass it through 
the peak shaving service to make that more competitive. Um, moving on, taking a step kind of a little bit higher, uh, the benefits of battery energy storage are, you know, it, it's a very flexible resource that can perform a lot of the duties that traditional gas peakers uh, would have performed or uh, can displace the need for investment in distribution and transmission infrastructure by just being there, charged up, ready to discharge at the right time. Um, and so this can result in uh, basically without the need for um, shoring up your distribution infrastructure, your transmission infrastructure, better grid resilience. Uh, it can result in higher quality, lower cost electricity. So you might be uh, swapping out um, peaking capabilities from a gas generator or some other generator that can't respond quite as quickly as a battery can. Um, you know, you can think about uh, how quickly your accelerator and EV kicks on um, when you hit the gas pedal. Uh, if you have the good fortune of having an, uh, an EV, I'm still waiting in line for mine. Um, but that turns on right away, right? Uh, versus a, a uh, traditional fossil fuel unit that uh, will take some time to ramp and it will uh, have a carbon footprint while it's ramping and then while it's producing. So uh, there are many environmental benefits to seeing a battery step in and, and offset uh, what would have been conventional generation resource. Environmental sustainability, uh, there's no water requirements for a battery. Um, it is uh, a pretty non-invasive construction that can be lifted and relocated um, at the end of its life cycle or recycled and the capabilities of recycling are improving daily uh, for a project that is 20 years in length um, we have a high degree of certainty that we'll go from uh, a good recycling regime to uh, something much more sophisticated a couple of decades from now. Um, improved renewables integration, you know, uh, you've heard uh, the duck curve in California. Um, the more that you see solar piling in, uh, the more you have a mismatch between supply and demand, and the more you might have congestion on, uh, on certain circuits and bandwidth constraints that storage can by its nature alleviate by soaking up power uh, when those wires are constrained and then discharging them uh, in a way that it mit mitigates some of the volatility that um, we're increasingly going to encounter on our systems with uh, the rise of um, wind and solar and well, a bit further down the line, when everyone starts uh, plugging in um, high consuming electric vehicles onto those same circuits. Um, energy storage market trends. So, you know, we are seeing a huge increase in the deployment of batteries. Um, and with that has come, you know, the proliferation of this technology, making it uh, highly bankable, um, making you know, major players emerge with highly uh, warranties that last for the life of the project. Um, and the costs themselves have, have come down. We've had a bit of a disruption to that trend. Uh, it's kind of the same trend that we saw in solar where solar went down by 20x in price over the course of 12 years. Um, here with, uh, with batteries, we, we started to see that happening um, dramatically. And uh, in the last six to nine months, that has been put on pause and reversed a little bit uh, because of commodity constraints and, uh, and well, the general um, difficulties in, in the market. Uh, but we expect this, this uh, uh, cumulative capacity chart to continue flying high and uh, with it, the cost of, of batteries to uh, continue a, a downward decline. Relevant experience, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, we're not building massive batteries for investor-owned utilities uh, or, you know, large 
transmission projects as non-wireless alternatives where uh, for the most part, we're working with uh, communities on smaller utility scale projects with uh, rural electric co-ops and with municipal utilities. Uh, we've always focused here because we think it's more interesting. Um, you can do more with a battery uh, when you're a bit more strategic about uh, how you locate it and how many things you can you can do um, with you know uh, municipal utilities in New England. There's a great opportunity to add a ton of value by focusing on peak shaving as a first priority because the demand charges are so high, and then thinking about how to cite the battery in a way that, that can add additional value. Uh, you can't do these things if you're you know, tied into the transmission system and uh, just you know, selling a tolling agreement to an investor in utility. Um, we have templates for all different shapes and sizes of projects. Um, I said we, we, we focus our work on uh, co-ops and municipal utilities, but we do also work with IOUs, you know, we're working uh, with Dominion at the moment on uh, their large investor in utility on a larger project. It's quite plain vanilla, uh, has a tolling agreement that looks like, uh, you know, long-term power purchase agreement from a conventional generation resource. Uh, but we're also doing things that are a bit more creative, uh, performance-based capacity agreements. That's uh, the, the, been the focus with BEPSA, and we can get a little bit more into that if you guys would like. Uh, shared savings agreements where you have a kind of long-term contract to share the benefits that the battery can generate uh, without a specific price in mind. Um, so that, that has us bearing a little bit more risk and um, is priced slightly different as a result. Um, and we have a very large network of uh, suppliers across the value chain um, getting our projects to construction. Uh, plenty of big names in there that you'd all recognize and, and some smaller ones that you might not. Uh, obviously, you've got the Teslas of the world. You've got uh, the, the battery manufacturers like Panasonic, LG, Samsung, um, Siemens through their, uh, their shop Fluence. Um, Mitsubishi is a major integrator. So, you know, a lot of big names with large balance sheets that when you buy things off of them uh, and you enter into a contract with us or a developer uh, or Vepsa does, um, behind that contract sits, you know, a, a highly bankable technology warranty uh, so that we aren't left stranded if something goes wrong. And hence, uh, we are on the hook for something we can uh, make good on on the other side of the contract. Um, I mentioned earlier our, our project in Danville, Virginia. This is, uh, it's in the PJM footprint. Uh, so slightly different market uh, opportunities for us. The, the frequency regulation market there is uh, a lot more attractive. So uh, that's a, a bigger benefit that we're passing through, but uh, the demand charges are less interesting. Um, so uh, that would be a, a slightly different kind of balance of, uh, of value in, in Danville. Uh, they have about a 210 megawatt peak load. Um, so pretty, pretty large, uh, although you may never heard of them. Uh, they're, they're pretty large uh, city out in the kind of central South Virginia. Uh, we have a 20 year power purchasing agreement with them, uh, energy storage services agreement, ESSA, whatever you want to call it. It's the same type of agreement. Uh, that we are looking at with FEPSA, where basically we have, uh, you know, call it in this case a 10 megawatt battery for simplicity. We look to hit the coincident peaks throughout the course of the year. In the case of Hardwick, you've got 13 of them. In the case of Danville, there are six, so slightly different. Uh, we got to uh, be laser focused on hitting those six windows as opposed to those 13. Um, but if we only hit 90% of the peaks during those coincident peak events, we are only paid uh, our PPA rate, our ESSA rate uh, at 90%. If we hit half of them, only 50%. So 
uh, we're really bearing all of the performance risk around this technology and around our ability to predict the peaks, uh, which is a, a somewhat novel approach that uh, we have uh, created a kind of core competency around. Um, and then when we're not doing those peak shaving activities, we're uh, jumping into the PJM ancillary services market. Uh, we're, we're participating in frequency regulation and uh, having that boost the economics of the project. And that's coming online very soon. You can see there, you've got eight shipping containers, uh, about 40 foot in length. And uh, those collectively compose the 25-ish megawatt hours, the 10 megawatt, 10 and a half megawatt capacity uh, with roughly two and a half hour duration at the beginning of life. Uh, that's two and a half times 10-ish, gets you to 25-ish. Um, other public power projects that we are developing across the East Coast uh, Massachusetts, we have three municipal projects that um, will have operational in the first half of next year. Uh, the first couple are in Groton, Massachusetts. Uh, don't know if you're familiar with Groton. It's home of Lawrence Academy, uh, not far from Boston. Uh, we got another one not far off Groton, uh, five megawatt, 15 megawatt hour battery. That one's kind of interesting. It's sited next to a a medical facility and uh, medical facility data center provides emergency backup to that data center in the event that there's an outage. At all other times, it's providing peak shaving services to the utility and a bit of uh, regulation participation to make the economics more interesting. Um, Vermont, of course, uh, we have been working with Sean and his team at BEPSA uh, and uh, have a few uh, that are kind of at the, the front of the queue, if you will, at the moment, we're having our first project studied now um, in Northfield uh, near the King Street substation. And uh, we've got several others that we're looking very closely at. So, uh, you know, would be really uh, excited to have the opportunity to think about how, how Hardwick fits into uh, that first wave of projects or the second wave of projects. Uh, we're, we're looking for a long partnership here with BEPSA and um, it seems like there's a lot of appetite because the savings are really interesting. Um, we're also working with Green Mountain Power and uh, other utilities in Vermont at, at different sites. Um, and so we are very frequently in the area. Uh, as I mentioned, we have an office in, in Burlington and uh, we don't live there, but we, I think Mike and I uh, increasingly would like to because it's such a beautiful region and uh, Burlington is a, a really nice place to be uh, forced to go on business. So um, DOE innovation funding, we are also you know, doing our very best to tap into grant funding available through the government. Uh, we have positioned ourselves already for some of that and are deploying it with a large generation and transmission cooperative in, uh, in the Midwest in Indiana uh, called Hoosier Energy. And uh, because we are, you know, right next to Capitol Hill, we are uh, a stone to throw away from, uh, I don't know if that's the right, the right word in, in the Capitol, but uh, we're not far away from, uh, from the halls of Congress and, and can always drop in on uh, uh, state representatives and we do so frequently. So we're we are on an ongoing basis trying to fertilize some more of, uh, of that grant funding potential where possible for these projects that are good for the climate and are uh, good for the cost savings of uh, the rural communities that we're working with. It's, pretty, it's a pretty easy sell um, on Capitol Hill. And, and we've got stuff, you know, we got stuff going on across the mid-Atlantic, Northeast, and, and into the Midwest. Uh, again, a lot of work with public power utilities, generation and transmission cooperatives, and joint action agencies alike. And, uh, and um, yeah, the pipeline continues to, to grow for us, and um, it's an exciting space to be, be working in. Uh, the VEPSA partnership, I think I... I already spoke to this to the most part. Um, if you guys have any pointed questions, 
you know, again, our the focus of these systems is reduce the duration to the extent possible uh, because duration is the megawatt hours of batteries that you put into the system. Reduce that so the capex is as low as possible uh, while also giving you enough comfort to be able to predict those coincident peak windows and run the battery for as long as you need to hit the one hour window. Uh, we're gravitating toward a three hour solution uh, with Sean in, in the, all of these sites. Uh, and that gives us a lot of confidence to uh, hit the coincident peaks with a um, you know, high degree of, of accuracy. Uh, we are comfortable uh, standing by 95% uh, at a three hour system. The folks we work with uh, that, that perform predictive dispatch around positioning for the coincident peak events, they would say they're 100% confident uh, with a three hour duration battery. So uh, that is very much the focus of what we're doing with BEPSA. And, um, you know, we are looking at whatever we can do to drive down the price of the contract that is focused on that priority service by adding in additional uh, layers of revenue through the ISO New England market. Um, peak saving economics, uh, you know, this is uh, our shared view with uh, Sean. Uh, correct me if I'm overstepping Sean, but uh, for the most part, this is where we think the, uh, the, the, uh, capacity part, the capacity prices are going over time. Uh, this forecast was produced by a leading market analyst called Send Analytics. Um, but you know, the, the, uh, con there, there's a lot of consensus out there on the direction of the capacity market. While it's a little bit up and down, um, the long-term view is that it will continue to rise. Uh, the same can be said for transmission charge outlook. Uh, we have uh, also um, engaged the Send Analytics to produce this curve, uh, but it's very consistent with these are the uh, th these are the ISO New England transmission charge outlooks uh, year by year and looking forward, and uh, and so the the uh, uh, forecast off of that is very similar. Sizing analysis for Hardwick. So we uh, we looked at the monthly load uh, during coincident peaks, and going all the way back to 2004. And here you see the the megawatts dipping up and down uh, to a peak here in 2005 of, uh, of about eight. I think it was 7.9, eight megawatts um, dipping down in. Uh, several instances to the kind of four and a half megawatt mark and then in one what seems like slightly anomalous event uh, dipping down to three and a half megawatts. Um, during the single annual uh, the single annual peak you've got uh, a, a slightly um, higher or a slightly more uh, stable uh, sizing based on the, those historical loads during the coincident peak events, uh, dipping down to four and a half megawatts um, and getting up uh, just above six at a couple points in time. Uh, we also thought about the impact of uh, bringing in additional solar. Uh, so for every one megawatt of solar that is, uh, is hitting that coincident peak event, um, it's, uh, it's about 0.26 megawatt impact, um, on the monthly, it's about a 0.11, uh, megawatt impact. So, uh, crudely speaking, if, uh, you're putting in three megawatts of solar, uh, call this 0.33 megawatts of impact on, uh, this historical monthly load, uh, during the peak, the peak events. So, you know, maybe this is coming down closer to four um, uh, during those, uh, those specific events where you see it uh, dropping a bit lower here. Um, maybe you're coming down to uh, three and a half on uh, those, those one-off um, uh, kind of infrequent uh, lower um, 
peak events. So uh, we'd be happy to get into the weeds with you guys on this stuff, but uh, we ran a, a kind of net present value analysis of uh, what value this would generate for uh, Hardwick in terms of uh, peak shaving savings at different sizes. Um, and, you know, the, the moral of the story is uh, it's not as straightforward as you think it might be when you look at uh, this chart and you see uh, one event coming down to three and a half megawatts, you might say, well, we, we shouldn't ever cross that threshold. That's not exactly true because uh, you have scale economies on the investment itself, mobilizing to the site, uh, the battery supply, and all the other times you're uh, having the ability to tap into more megawatts. So it's a, a bit of an optimization on, on net present value of a slightly lower cost per megawatt system and its ability to always uh, be able to hit those peaks with full nameplate capacity. Um, our assessment is that a five megawatt, a 4.99 megawatt battery to be precise because of interconnection reasons, uh, a roughly five megawatt battery is the right size uh, in terms of maximizing the MPV impact of the project. Um, it's probably, it, it probably bears reiterating here that we are taking the performance risk of the project. So if the battery is only dispatched at uh, half capacity, then we are only getting paid for half capacity. Um, that's it. So I've droned on for 25 minutes here. Uh, I would uh, love to receive any questions you've got. I'm sure the rest of my team would uh, like to chime in as well, but maybe before keeping the floor, we could, we could hear if you guys have any uh, specific points of discussion that you'd like to raise. I have a ton of them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see any. Uh, that, so ownership structure, uh, you know, uh, who's paying for what? Uh, how is the value of the, the services being captured? Um, where does that go? I mean, I, I, I don't see where any of the who's putting in the money, who's getting the money out, uh, how, how that's working. Maybe you can. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Let me tackle that directly. So we are uh, making all of the investment and we're structuring a long term services agreement right. with VEPSA to provide those services at a predefined rate, uh, a dollar per month rate that will be superior to the demand charges that you currently incur associated with the coincident peak events throughout the year. So you will, you will run the numbers and you will see that uh, you're saving X percent and uh, you're saving X percent over X many years and the NPV is uh, however many dollars. Uh, if we fail to discharge the battery during the events where you, we are attempting to reduce your demand charges, then, uh, you know, megawatt for megawatt, the payment that we receive is reduced, right? So, um, is, it, is it reduced by the avoided cost or by just by the cost of the energy? It's reduced by the payment that you would otherwise make to us so that um, if we are if we have agreed to, you know, let's just call it for simplicity, $10. If we agreed to $10, then uh, we only are able to successfully dispatch the system 50% of the time during coincident peak events, we get paid $5, right? You mean during peak events? No, no so the, the peak events are the backbone of the services agreement. Right. So we get paid monthly uh, based on our success at hitting those peak events. Vince, the way you characterize it to my ears was right. The, the lot, most of the value is locked up, not locked up, is evident in the avoided cost. 
of the of the peak event. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, and and what, for example, can you give me a, a kilowatt month cost, or like a what type of cost you're talking about, and what type of savings? Can you do based on the? Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No. The the two charts that uh, Rory just put up, the uh, transmission charge equates to something like twelve dollars a kilowatt month right now, growing at seven percent a year, roughly. So it's going up quick. Okay. Add to that two to five to six dollars over time for capacity. So 12 plus two is at least 14 at the present moment. Uh, by the time you get out five years, it's going to be in the upper teens, lower 20s at a minimum. So that's your avoided cost. And if you hit right. that 95% of the time and pay, you know, we don't have firm pricing for the battery yet, but I think $15 a kilowatt month is not unrealistic, for instance, you'd make that difference. And it grows over time. You're going to have a fixed levelized cost of the battery, most likely, uh, maybe with some O&M growth. We haven't negotiated those details yet. But uh... right. so, so, just so to... the real, the Sorry. real question, Sean, is how, <clears throat> how much confidence does everybody have in this chart projecting the future? The cost chart. This chart we're looking at right here. Sorry, I'm looking at faces. I need to get back to the chart. It, it goes. It goes back to 2015. So this is some real data. There we go. Oh, that chart. Yeah. No. First of all, Ascend Economics is outstanding, and this is very much the trend I'm seeing. Uh, you know, it could steepen. Frankly, you know, we have a lot of transmission build out simply to get the offshore wind that's in the pipeline uh, interconnected. So. Um, I don't see a lot of risk that the transmission curve is going to flatten. Uh, and that's where most of the value is, probably 80% of the value. So, so if I get that, just like nuts and bolts, Rory, uh, so you guys would be providing the investment, the installation, doing the interconnection, uh, and uh, uh, Hardwick Electric would enter into uh, uh, energy storage services agreement with you guys for discharge during. Okay, maybe you can go into more detail, both of the peaks and like capacity between the peaks. Yeah, so you have you have 12 monthly coincident peaks and one single annual coincident peak, right? right. And so our entire reason for being is to discharge the battery during those 13 hours of the year. Uh, in order to do that with sufficient margin of safety, uh, we have to discharge it more than 13 times a year, right? Every time we think it might happen, we got to position the battery. Every time we think it could be it, we got to discharge the battery. Uh, so call it, you know, 50 to 60 times per year, we are discharging the battery fully during an event we think is, could be the coincident peak event. Could be either the single annual or could be, one of the monthly coincident peaks. Um, once you've had the monthly coincident peak, uh, you know, once you've exceeded the uh, the threshold of uh, the the. Uh, now I'm confusing myself. Um, as you as you continue to operate the battery, uh, you will be um, better adept at. Uh, reducing the cycling over time. Sean, how does the uh, recharging of the battery fit into the equation? There's my <laughs> next question. Yeah, so the way it presently works in Vermont, and we know this because Green Mountain Power has filed and received a certificate of public good for this arrangement, they felt, GMP felt, that they had to charge retail rates to the battery uh, owner for charging it. They just That was their interpretation of the law. They bent over backwards in the energy storage service agreement to reimburse the owner of the battery such that they eventually paid wholesale rates. Think, you know, locational marginal prices uh, here in Vermont. So uh, the... End point is we want to charge and discharge at wholesale. Uh, the way to get there may involve charging a retail rate and some structuring in the ESSA. 
Okay, so not not nailed down yet. Not nailed down yet. So uh, the 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 charge to Hardwick Electric from DeLorean would be for those specific discharges for uh, for every discharge that, that you guys have to make to attempt to uh, cover the the peaks or just for the ones that are su successfully cover the peaks. It will be just for successful coverage of the peaks, but it will be spread out and normalized over the course of the year so that we have a reliable cash flow for our project, a monthly, okay. a monthly payment associated with 13 events that could happen at you know uh, any day in the month. Okay, and the, the way it was written, there was a, essentially a performance guarantee. Uh, you know where you you take on the whatever the liability or yeah that's right so you know we if we don't perform then there's a pro rata reduction in the payment okay and that would just be the payment it wouldn't be the actual cost that would be incurred because of the additional you know because of not Part no of because you know we we wouldn't right Alternatively, the battery wouldn't be there, right? So, um, so Rory, it is, uh, it, is, it is sufficiently punitive for us to lose the entirety of our revenues by, uh, you know, underperforming. No, no, a, a, yeah, absolutely. Except the cost to hydroelectric ends up being substantially more too. Potentially, does it come? I don't think it does come more. So, basically, if if you go online and you totally fail, we're going to pay what we would normally pay if we didn't have the battery storage it sounds like that's correct so it really doesn't cost us anything in terms of more than we would typically pay we might have said hey instead of battery we would have looked at something else but it doesn't cost us any more that's correct your only exposure is to this chart on slide 12 and this chart on slide 11 so it, you know you have to you have to be comfortable that we're, we're uh, living in a world of increasing demand charges. Um, you know, if, the, if the, the way that these charges are levied changes, then uh, we go back to the drawing board and, and we figure something out that works for everyone. But that is not the expectation, <laughs> very much not the expectation. So although we, I'm sorry, so although we wouldn't, oh, who's going? <laughs> go ahead, Lynn. No, no, Michael, go. So although we wouldn't have to pay more than we typically would if we didn't have you, but if we did go into this agreement with you, we'd be planning our future for years to come. If there was a total failure, it would put us in a bind. Do you guys have performance bonds we can ask you to get? to cover our loss, what wouldn't be our losses, but would be our losses in terms of other ways we would have mitigated the increased cost of the uh, demand charge. Can you get a performance bond? Yeah, I mean, I guess that, I guess your question is around like, you've invested in this solution and then uh, we're underperforming and you feel solutionless. Uh, so you need to go out and get another solution. Right. What, wouldn't another possibility be that I, I'm, I'm I, obviously I haven't seen the templates of your agreements, but I would I would hope that there are events of default in there, that um, if if there's persistent underperformance or non-performance, that the contract can be terminated. Yeah, that's. Or, or there uh, may be liquidated damages. I mean, there are lots of ways of 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 approaching this. Yeah, I mean, liquidated damages are a bit tricky because we are already liquidated damaging ourselves by not performing yeah. um, on a unit for unit basis. So, you know, if we don't perform, yeah. we're like getting no revenue. Um, Rory, what would the, what would the ballpark uh, capital investment be that you were making roughly from the five megawatt installation? Well, you know, it's been uh, it's been a moving target in the last six months, the last nine yeah, months. And I, I, we're not holding you. I'm just curious what kind of money you're talking. That ballpark number. Yeah, I mean, for simplicity, let's call it a million bucks a megawatt. 
Okay, um, that's good. But it's okay. it's it's all over the place. I mean, we have been <clears throat> we have been uh, working very diligently to make the the equation as compelling as possible here, and and uh, working with Vepsil in doing so. Well, I, the reason I wanted you to put a number out there is because I don't think you're looking to go spend five million bucks and then lose it. Mike, can't hear you. Yeah, I I heard Mike. Yeah, we, no, we don't want to move the battery. But if it's an event of default, then you know uh, that you know that <laughs> we won't be uh, we won't be operating the battery in such a way that we would be triggering you know the need for default. You would. Uh, you know, we can we can see what the details of the contract look like, but uh, the solution will not be to kick us out. It will be to uh, address the issues that may arise and make sure that that battery, that installation, is hitting with the highest degree of accuracy it can. So, if the if you were to couple this installation that we're talking about for hardware with a solar array to charge it most of the time, what kind of size array would you need to charge it? Um, the, re the reason I'm asking- Very large. Is, yeah, the reason I'm asking is because we have uh, quite a parcel of property that's uh, the next stage of an abandoned gravel pit where we would look at for sure. Uh, so there would be room for this equipment and potentially another solar array to couple with it. So that's yeah. why I'm asking. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, um, five megawatts of solar is uh, is pretty is a pretty big footprint, right? Um, yeah. You you might be you might be looking at twenty plus acres. Yeah, we wouldn't um, want to do that. Right. Um, so. Yeah, and then it becomes a, a a bit of an optimization of you know it. So we are looking is, at this that, elsewhere, this option, in the shop. This yeah. option isn't on your radar yet. It, not in not on a parcel that you guys think might be suitable. Uh, okay, we we have the chops to develop uh, a solar plant very very easily. Then the issue becomes. Uh, whether they should be integrated at all. Um, and that is a good question. Okay. Uh, there I was are just some, brainstorming. Some... We, can, we can drop that right there. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you guys have, if you guys are short on renewable energy, then, uh, you know, we can mobilize a single time and develop two projects. Uh, operationally, you know, the, the interface between solar and what we are doing here is quite limited. It would really be a kind of tax optimization. And to make the tax optimization meaningful, we'd have to build a pretty big solar plant. Uh, the, 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 amount, the size of the discharge, you know, just it's under five for inter interconnection stuff, but it, it looks like it's, you'd be, looks like you'd be selling uh, peak shaving services to not just hardware electric from that discharge. Is that right, or is this exclusive to it? Because it looks like it completely covers the 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 um, demand of hardware electric for those three hours. Right. So on your system, we would be looking to lower your demand charges to the maximum degree. We would only be selling hardware electric. Okay. Yeah, answer the question squarely. Yeah. Yeah. So just bringing it, uh, bringing the demand that uh, essentially the transmission costs down. To, well, bring yeah. it as low as that peak, as low as possible. Is that how that works? Just on That's the, right. Okay. Yeah. And if there are limitations on backfeeding the substation or something like that, we can put in a, like a relay there such that the battery is, is, you know, basically discharging up to uh, the level of loading that is currently on that substation. So there so, are, yeah. So the, uh, the the peak shaving recoupment or savings is is it's it's linear. I mean, it's a linear. Um, it's a, a 
proportional to the amount of discharge. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Huh. I mean, it doesn't like reach, you know, whatever the average is of, of the, of the use, for example, which is the thing that constrains, not constrains, but defines transmission requirements, I, I guess is what I'm saying. I mean, like bringing it down, that's I, I, just a little confusing. I mean, it sounds great. It's just sure. confusing. Yeah, I mean, it, it basically during coincident peak events, uh, the town of Hardwick will be supplied with electricity from the battery instead right. of instead of pulling electricity off of the transmission system. Which which so, almost seems like it's it's an artificial thing. It really it's artificially uh, selecting that peak, not not to bring it down to like average demand, but to bring it down. I mean, it's almost like a, a you know a, a financial trick. You know you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's great. If that works, but it it because yeah, that's, uh, you're 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 arbitraging the capacity value uh, by um, having a capacity resource when the capacity resource is needed by the system, and right. then not pulling power across the system into Hardwick when uh, you know all of all of the infrastructure is burdened and prices are high. All right. Uh, Roger and, and Nat, you've been both been very quiet. Do you have any questions? Got a ton of questions, but they would start with, you know, I'm not at all convinced that anything along these lines is a necess is needed for a small outfit like uh, Hardwick. So I would be starting at a very simple. A set of questions and uh, you know Vince knows more about all this peak shaving uh, the whole thing sounds like a, a game that uh, I don't want to enter I mean I just cannot believe that this would work for Hardwick I can be convinced but it would take quite a while is it your I, question what what the downside is it sounds like that's what you're asking what the risk is well I mean I, I don't understand most of this I, you know, I understand what peak shaving is and all that and who's doing the investing and, you know, the, this historical forecast or NS rate, but I'm very skeptical. Um, Cause I've, I've heard for years that batteries are not worth it. There, some of them are going to only last about 10 or 15 years. We don't know. Um, maybe that's not our risk. Maybe DeLorean is accepting that risk, but sure. I mean, you, do you want to, Try, Roy, to tell me what the downside risk or is for for us. I mean, that's, that's it's purely it, the the only risk that you are bearing is what you see on this chart and what you see on slide eleven. If you believe in the direction of these charges, then uh, entering into a contract to mitigate your exposure to them makes a lot of sense, right? It's back to Sean's. Well, yeah, I mean, but I mean, the, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's you're, you're hedging, you're hedging your risk against uh, what is a, a consensus around the expectation that charges will increase over time. All of the performance is ours to bear. You mentioned that people have been saying bad things about batteries and they may only last 10 or 15 years. That's ours. Yeah. That's our risk to bear. Well, you know, that sounds too perfect. Um, I just, I just don't see that Hardwick, Hardwick has, has such a need. Um, I mean, we just started in on this H11 project. Um, our hydro is going nicely. We're obviously like everybody else facing, you know, tremendous potential increases because of gas and oil, but, um, my reaction would be to sit on our system for at least a year to make sure we know what we're doing. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to doubt whoever provided the, the slope, the angle of increase for your graph, but you know, uh, that's way beyond me. I, uh, I, I do know some people in the industry, so I'll, I'll, I'll throw this to them and see what, they, what questions they have. You see, you're, you're presenting uh, and working with VEPSA in the hopes of setting up a, 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 a 
a set of systems for each of these towns that belong to Vepsa. Um, you know, fine. And, and at some point, a firm offer would come from you on, because there has been virtually, there's been not one mention of how much we're going to, th this is costing. I mean, I, I just, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think um, that will come and yeah. you will find that if you believe in these charts, uh, which, you know, this is not, I think Ascend Analytics is tremendous, tremendously sophisticated, but this isn't uh, a stretch of the imagination to imagine these historicals will continue uh, a pace into the future. Uh, this is around the amount of transmission infrastructure dollars are invested and in what needs to be recouped to cover the cost of those fixed investments. So it's it, this curve in particular is one that uh, folks are pretty comfortable with because it's basically a lagging recoup of dollars that have been invested into the system and need to be recaptured uh, through shared payments by all of the uh, transmission dependent participants. Um, so I, you know, the economics will, will bear themselves to you. I think the, uh, the, 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 the question of whether to do something or not, um, those economics will have to speak for themselves. Uh, if something is worth uh, a few million dollars of net present value or whatever it is based on the way that you've, you've calculated uh, the savings over time, then you know that to not act uh, is a cost. Right. Unless of course you're and the shared expectation that this uh, occurs does not occur and dramatically does not occur, right? So I, uh, I hear you. I think uh, it ultimately it's just, we're taking the technology risk away from you and leaving you with a mathematical equation uh, and a risk tolerance to, you know, exposing yourself to this uh, cost over time or uh, exposing yourself slightly differently to it over time, hedging uh, your total exposure to it. And your and your contracts, you try to write for how many years? Twenty years. Right. So yeah. We would be talking about twenty years, boy. <laughs> so the risks, I think, <clears throat> Rory, correct me if I'm wrong. Are you don't believe this chart you're going. Like it's anything. real hard to hear you. At least. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that be that better? Yes. Now bit. we can see you and we can hear you. We couldn't see you either. Well, I was eating something before. I didn't want you to have to. <laughs> he was that. scuba diving. That's why he couldn't see you. <laughs> You'd gone for a swim. Yeah. So uh, the risk, I think, and that's where that question started. What is I think, and Sean and Rory, correct me if I'm wrong is if we were to say, nope, this chart's totally wrong and we didn't do anything and we didn't take any action and it happened exactly like this chart shows. That's one risk. The other risk is, on the other side of the coin, is we do something with you and <clears throat> of those 13 peaks, you know, obviously there would be contractual penalties, whatever, but you don't hit those peaks you don't hit one or two or 10 or whatever, you miss it. The cost that we incur when you miss, I think has not been discussed here. What, what about that number? And how do we deal with that, Sean? So if that's flipped, you know, Rory's, Rory's equipment, whatever, somebody sabotaged it and it needs a six week repair. And so he missed, Two of the events that he needed to hit that year, what kind of dollars is that going to hit us with on the other side of the sword? Yeah, you default back to the status quo. You'll pay ICE in New England for this regional network service okay. rate. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the risk is the opportunity cost from not having entered into an arrangement with somebody right. else. Yeah. Yeah. And if we um, rewind a couple of years, yeah. There was some market rule risk here two years ago that really doesn't manifest today. Um, you know, somebody 
uh, transmission owner or ISO New England itself can choose to file the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission change the calculation on how these transmission charges are socialized and calculated. Hasn't happened in many decades. As Lynn can tell you, you're not going <laughs> to get in these long protracted fights at FERC over things like this. But um, without telling the whole story in detail, you know, some language modifications were made at the committee level in ISO New England. And, and this uh, approach to calculating and socializing the uh, cost of transmission in New England is stabilized a lot in, in our view. Uh, that's myself and Ken Nolan primarily at BEPSO over the past two years. So the risk I saw two years ago, Nathaniel, was that the rules would change in the 20 year term. And uh, that's still possible, but you know, if you need a separate presentation, we can take into the history of how things have evolved to make us comfortable uh, at VEPSO with that scenario. Lynn, so, you, would invite, you had invited me to comment. Um, I wanted to listen through the whole thing. And, and I'm, I'm actually highly enthusiastic about continuing along. You know, we have the choice with VEPSA of being, you know, never doing it, being the, the, last, comp the last VEPSA member to do it. Um, well, I, I think we've lost our opportunity probably to be the first or second. But, you know, to be on the leading edge of this or be, you know, in the middle of the pack, I'm highly enthusiastic about looking at it. Can, and it, of course, it's conditional on, and I don't think it's that complicated for us because of the business proposition. It's really conditional under the numbers make sense in this base case scenario. And can we get comfortable with the contract behind the numbers? Because the, the numbers are going to be based on the expected performance. And then there's going to be, uh, you know, we'll have to look at it in if, if it's not performing and the and and they forego some payments and we pay less is it still attractive so all the potential outcomes how do we feel about it and then to nat's point because we really this isn't going to stretch our resources that much i don't think mike you know these nope. these guys are basically dropping it into our system and i think we'd be wrong not to explore it and frankly we'd be wrong not to do it if it's going to help us forego a rate increase that's our you know, that's what we, that's what we're supposed to do, look for ideas and opportunities and things like this to do deals to enter into that'll keep, keep rates down. And this is a key area of pressure on our rates, I think. Now, Mike, I want to defer to you, but that's the way I saw it. And I don't think we have to get all caught up in our underwear on a huge number of details because it's, it's, I think these folks have simplified it down to a pretty pretty simple proposition where they've got a lot of the risk we'd usually be tormented over. Yeah. You know, the implementation risk, the technology risk, the risk, risk, risk on a new thing. They're basically holding on to all those risks, insulating us from them and giving us an opportunity to benefit. So I, I, we don't have enough information to decide if we want to do it or not, but I think if the numbers come forward and they're compelling, at least it'd have my vote. I agree 100% with everything you said, Roger. And I think the environmental benefits and the, the grid transmission benefits and the goals of Hardwick Electric's integrated resource plan require that we do it. I mean, it, it, it's. Whoa, 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 whoa. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they hard. require I mean, that we examine it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's right in there. If you read it, it's right in there. It's just, I've read it all. I've read the, it all about let's, story. Not get, let's not get into an argument right now. No, all right. We're, whatever. So. Uh, uh, Vince, may I speak? If you've, you've, you've uh -huh. had a lot of time on this, and I'm not going to get into the weeds on, on some of the questions. Um, that, that I would have. One, one point I wanted to note is that the H11 project, the Encore project is 1.6 megawatts, I think not 2.3. And I don't know how that affects the sizing, but I just thought I would put that out there. Um, you had mentioned, Rory, when you were describing a, a project that it was 2.5 hours at the beginning of life. So is there degradation on, on these batteries? And, and so are you guaranteeing I mean, let's say that we're at 4.99, 4.99. Is that guaranteed for the 20 years or is there a degradation schedule that goes along with that? Uh, so 
it's a little bit nuanced to answer that question, but the 4.99 is the, the discharge capacity of the battery mm -hmm. at whatever duration exists after degradation. After uh, so if the, if the duration of the system is three and a half hours at the beginning of life, it will degrade over time to call it three hours by the end of life. Uh, it's, it depends on exactly how we treat the battery over time, how we cycle it and uh, what the technology is. Each battery behaves a little bit differently and has a different warranty, but uh, I think what will, in all likelihood, what we will see here is something like 75 to 80 percent of the beginning of life duration at the end of life. They'll always be they'll always be 4.99 megawatts of capability. The question is how much how long can we discharge it for? And so over time, the battery becomes slightly less capable at the same power capacity. You can just derate the battery so that you have the same capability or the same kind of uh, uh, sophistication in terms of your predictive analytics. You could just derate the power capacity. So, you know, instead of at five megawatts, you discharge the battery at four megawatts for longer. And if you whittle it down a little bit over time, then hypothetically, you'd have the same exact duration throughout the entire life. That's the, the other taking. The other, sorry, go ahead. It, is that a risk that you're taking or that we're taking? So that that degradation curve is warranted by the uh, battery manufacturer. So they say, you know, we we are going to guarantee that this is what the degradation curve looks like. We'll share that with uh, with you guys and with Vepsa before. Uh, we finalize the contract. Usually we put that in the contract. We show what the expectation is over time based on what we plan to do with the battery. Um, and so you plan around it. You know how capable it is uh, with how many hours of runtime, if you will, at full discharge capacity. Um, the other thing that you, you see, uh, the other the method that you see in the industry is capacity maintenance where you're continuing to go to the site and put batteries into the system to keep it at the same level throughout you know, a 20 year contract or whatever it may be. That has cost to it, right? And the smaller the system, the more that cost starts to undermine the kind of viability and the, the value proposition of the system. You gotta go out there every three years, every five years, mobilize a team, have additional site ready to receive additional batteries. Uh, you know, all that comes with a cost. So what we tend to do, uh, except in some of the, the much bigger projects that we're building, uh, is position the system to, to sit there without remobilizing the site over and over again, without topping up and putting more batteries in. Position it to be able to perform very well uh, with a guaranteed degradation curve from the battery manufacturer. Thanks. Um, on, on the energy side, in terms of charging the <clears throat> excuse me, charging the battery. I mean, it strikes me that, that there may be some risk for us there to the extent that we're selling you energy to top this up at a higher cost. I mean, at a lower cost than what the energy is costing us if we're depending upon how that is structured. That's, that's yeah, not the yeah. intent. The intent is for it to just be a pass-through. To be a pass-through. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You can so, think of it as a pass through at wholesale, yeah. and yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's okay. It's that I, I guess that's the problem that was that Sean was talking about is that we don't have, or it seems that we can't charge a wholesale rate. Though I, it's an interesting thing about whether FERC ought to be having jurisdiction over this and not Vermont Public Utility Commission, but that's uh, 
yeah. Uh, that's a separate discussion. Um, any other question? I share Roger's view. I think that that uh, if the numbers pan out, it's, uh, it's something we should be we should be doing. We would be derelict in our responsibility if if uh, if we didn't. But it, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to turn on the numbers and the so, contract provisions. Uh, just just a hypothetical. So say for example. Uh, you end up saving um, avoided costs would be $15 per kilowatt month. Uh, and Hardwick Electric would sign the, the agreement they pay you guys. I mean, the risk is for Hardwick Electric is, is that difference between what the actuals, what they're paying and what the actual savings is. So, I mean, is that like a hypothetical? Like, for example, Hardwick Electric would pay. Uh, I'm just trying to get an idea of the structure that hardware collector would say, hypothetical, pay you $10 and uh, the savings would end up being $15. So hardware collector could save that $5. I mean, that, that's where the- That's where we would wanna be. The risk is that we, that, 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 that the, all those projections are off, okay? Right. And by some miracle, transmission costs come down. Um, and instead of, them following the line that they've been moving on with the with a very high correlation, they fall off. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and we've locked in a price that is that we're paying for the savings that in fact is higher than what we would have been paying for the capacity and transmission if we just paid for it. Yeah. That's that unless I'm missing something, that's that's the risk that we have. Yeah. And there, are, I mean, there are obviously ways in the contract for you guys to terminate it if <laughs> it ends up costing you way more money than it is saving you, so. Um, and is there a spot we could have five megawatt discharge in, in the distribution system? Without upgrades, Mike? Yeah, right next to any substation. Huh. Or next to the H11, because I overbuilt that entire circuit to accommodate future projects such as this. Any any other qu questions? Two quickie. One, one is the technology. It's pretty simple. I mean, we've been using batteries as backup for UP systems. 40 years and these are much better batteries but if i heard right you don't have any units in operation presently right this is all in the planning stage construction but nothing is really operating yet in terms of these systems not that i think the technology to get it operating is is, is difficult um so that was one question and the other is you know sounds like you know if hardwick is five million you probably have over 100 million dollars of investment going out to get these things done and I think we, we would need some comfort in the financial viability of the company. You know, what's the money backing this up? What happens if the whole company goes kaput? You know, they've overextended and there's not enough money and now we've got nothing. So, you know, I'm really interested in just financially, how stable is who we're getting into bed with? And that's something we can, we're not going to discuss now, but it's something you really have to present to us at some point. We'd have the battery. Well, <laughs> I, I, will, I will share that. Uh, Rory and, and your team, Mike, that uh, when Glenn Davis's name came up, our chair, uh, Lynn, was very impressed, and that doesn't happen often. So I would say you have a good leader there. And I was a little disappointed he didn't join us. Well, I will. Uh, I, I will let him know that, and uh, he'll, he'll show up next time. You can give Glenn my hello to, Say hello to Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Glenn, uh, Glenn has a pretty, pretty big social network out there. So, uh, glad to know there's some overlap here. And, uh, you know, we, we have just to assuage some concern on the, the financial credit worthiness. Um, we are, uh, we're growing fast and we have some very strong financial backing, um, the kind of beginning of that uh, was towards the tail end of last year as we closed a large corporate raise and we are uh, on the cusp of a, a, another 
quite large one um, in the coming weeks. Um, our equity backing uh, comes from a, an outfit called Greenbacker. Uh, they are a New York uh, private equity and um, they've got $2 billion in assets under management. Um, we have structured a, a unique relationship with them where uh, a lot of developers have a kind of, a lot of developers have a relationship with Greenbacker or with uh, a fund like Greenbacker, whereby when they get a project to construction ready, they push it into a fund and then the guys that were on the ground the whole time walk away and they focus on the next thing. We have like put that model on its head and the way that we do everything is uh, we build to stay and uh, our platform is not a develop and flip platform, but it is a develop, build, own, operate. Uh, we are investing in operational capabilities across our small team and across all the partners that we have and, uh, and creating something that will be there for a very long time. So. Uh, we've got a lot of financial muscle uh, that you might not see when you look at our slide deck, uh, yeah, but the, we've the also green, got, yeah. The Greenbacker model that you put on its head, Rory, is exactly the model and exactly the outfit that uh, was behind our H11 project, as well as the 2.2 megawatt center road, center road project, the two biggest projects within our system. So we're we're familiar with them and and their model. Okay. Uh, well, I don't know how to read that, Mike, but I uh, the model we put on its head, right? So hopefully you haven't had it. Yes, today. that's what I'm saying. We know that one, and you, <laughs> you're telling us you're putting on its head. That's exactly what I'm acknowledging. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, I think the yeah, other question so was around like construction and commissioning risk because we don't have an operational asset yet. So that is, you know, doing something with Hardwick is going to take multiple years at the fastest. Our first project will be operational in uh, about six weeks here time. Our projects in Massachusetts will be operational in the first half of next year. So I think, uh, you know, stay tuned on that. We are certainly uh, going to be willing and, and able to uh, show you guys some, some operational assets uh, near term, you know, as we kind of continue the conversation. Um, but, you know, we're, we've been around for three and a half years and these things take time and the pandemic certainly didn't do us any favors when it came to speeding up our, our development schedules on some of our first projects. So um, definitely. So Mike, yeah. Mike and Sean, where um, is Nor uh, Northfield in, in the process with you all? I know they were pretty excited, but I don't know where things are at this point with them specifically. Yeah, I can, I can give the same same update I gave Sean on, on Friday, but Northfield, uh, we have our friends at PLM performing the interconnection study right now. Um, we have just filed our 45 day notice to get our 248 permit moving. Um, we are going through all of our final, you know, environmental uh, diligence to file that application um and we are uh negotiating battery supply and doing an epc solicitation to find somebody to build it um, and what, what size is that one mike that is a three megawatt system three hours duration uh probably will hit notice to proceed as soon as we get our our 248 feed uh permit in hand so maybe 12 months from now uh hopefully have it built you know, towards the end of next year. Yep. This this is sort of going to a question that I had. I mean, if we were to proceed, what are we looking at time wise for Hardwick um, in a sort of in a best case? Three years. We could move faster than that. I mean, I, I think the the next 
you know, I think the, the, well, one of the big points of the conversation today and probably next steps is, is kind of agreeing on uh, a size for the project. You know, we're looking at the 4.99 as the maximum value. You know, once we all agree on uh, sizing, you know, figuring out where we're going to put it and what some realistic, you know, EPC costs associated would, with it would be based on the location. But once we have uh, kind of a location and a size, uh, we're ready to hit the ground running with with PLM to do the interconnection study or, you know, if, if you guys wanted to do it yourselves or have someone else you want to use. I mean, that was just kind of the arrangement that we set up with them as kind of partnered yeah, on all of our. Yeah, PLM is excellent. We don't have a problem with them. OK. Um, but, you know, I, it, I think it, it could move pretty quickly if we agreed on a size, a, a, a site and, and got the interconnection study moving. Um, you know, we've got the team ready to, to mobilize and replicate exactly what we're doing in Northfield. So maybe it's a few months behind that, uh, probably best case scenario. And the, the possibility of in integrating it with uh, emergency shelter backup is something to think about too. I, I don't know what hardwood shelter is, you know, the, if it's uh, if it's Hazen Union, I don't know if there's, you know, would require connection, but that's there's a big push. Eric's not on anymore, and uh, I have no idea whether Hardwick even has an emergency shelter. So no, I mean the town of Hardwick. Oh, Hardwick. I, yeah, uh, yeah, that's what I'm talking I about. Know. I yeah, don't yeah. know whether we do or we don't. Um, Certainly possible. I mean, we have another project that's providing backup power to a. Uh, a school down in Groton, Mass. Um, yeah, there is there is a little bit of additional uh, upfront cost uh, to enable that capability. A little bit of hardware and a little bit of uh, uh, kind of programming that needs to go into the energy management system for the asset. But uh, I'm I'm not aware. Maybe Mike is of any request from from uh, either. Hazen Supervisory Union or 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 no. OSSU for for any any kind. Right, there may not be a request because they've never thought of, it, but they don't know that you know. This, this yeah, but we're not we're not their boards. Uh, okay. No, I, 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 I know these these are these are things to think about though. This is this is actually creative use of this huge asset, potential creative use. If there are no more questions, um, either for from. The HED board, or from or from DeLorean for us. Um, I I, I'm sitting here wondering when Mira is going to start yelling at somebody. <laughs> <laughs> just mind my business. <laughs> <laughs> no, just listening in. And it's all great and enjoying some rain that finally came to where I live in Maine. So, uh, yep, no, just listening for now learning i'm sure we'll be talking more and hopefully in very calm tones for, <laughs> from now on <laughs> i want to just say thank you to all of you for 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 the effort and um we look forward to hearing more continuing the discussion and seeing i get well i guess the question is how what are the next steps i mean how do we I have one question, Lynn. It's okay. So, um, VEPSA, Rory, and Mike, and others, VEPSA initiated an effort for some solar arrays several years ago. And that's how we ended up with our H11 project. We kind of said, okay, VEPSA, thanks, but we're going to take this and run on our own and do it. And VEPSA gave us a lot of support, but we did do it on our own. And I could, I could see that happening on such a project as this. And is that something you'd be okay with? Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, Whatever suits your, suits your fancy. We're, uh, we're here to help and offer transparency and well, and that, that one kind of came about primarily because we owned the property. So we could work that all, the leasing and those dollars into the PPA price and it worked out good. 
I'm not saying that's going to happen this time, but things happen. That's, you know, so I'm just curious that you're willing or not willing to do it and you are. So that's great. Yeah. And I think to, to Lynn's point, I mean, that would be kind of, you know, I think it, it, in terms of next steps, you know, thinking about where the, where to put the thing, um, uh, and how big it's going to be. I mean, I certainly would be keen to have, hear any ideas uh, that you've got, Mike, um, in terms of you know what might be best from an interconnection perspective. What may, what might be best from a uh, you know if there are opportunities to provide other services to your system, uh, we can certainly look at that. But uh, you know we are not uh, currently uh running around hardwick looking for a piece of real estate to buy up to put our battery right. on so um very much would kind of defer to you if you've got a, a site in mind and you want us to take a harder look at it and you know get plm to run a power flow study or something like that you know very happy to kind of make those next steps happen and and, yeah, and we, so we have at least two sites that i would say are premium with minimal and i mean minimal interconnection costs associated so yeah we we have plenty of real estate that's not an issue okay and i think nat and others i mean if there are outstanding questions or concerns after this meeting you know happy to just kind of be a resource for the time being as well um you. you know if we we have a site we have a size you know we can certainly cook up some indicative numbers for you guys and you know having have something a little more concrete to discuss and put together you know a realistic timeline for a deployment and, and things like that as well so you know i know a lot of what we're talking about today is fairly conceptual but um very happy to look at you know something a little more specific once we we have a a site and project size to put our fingers on that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Well, I lost a chicken. Yes, oh, no. chickens. <laughs> to a fox. I didn't Aren't see it. Hungry? Yeah, you're always hungry. It was either a fox or a raccoon, I think. It was something that dug underneath the run and left right. half the chicken there. Oh. oh. <laughs> anyway. Um, okay. Um, any questions on the financial update um, for Beth? There seem to be an awful lot of refunds, including one that was $1,900. $1,900. Yeah. 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 Where, where, where are you? Yeah. Um, to a guy named Dan Bowman. Daniel yeah. Bowman. So those are, those are customer refunds, Matt. So yes. yes. So whoever it is, Mr. Bowman or Mr. Smith or whatever, they they have to pay us up front for a project. So they pay three thousand dollars for us to go build this line, and then they weren't able to get the easements or they didn't get the money they were going to get or whatever. So they canceled the job, and we just reimburse them for the money they yeah. gave us. I got you. Okay, nineteen hundred seems high. I got you. That makes yeah. sense. It, it's not electric. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> So the thing Beth needs to talk to us all about is the wrap uh, project. And Beth, I'm sorry, I don't have the bullet list in front of me, but. That's all right. Um, so Beth has been working with the folks at VHFA and she and I have worked up some numbers, looking at our costs, what, what we would, or what our best anticipation and calculation is of what our actual costs would be to administer the plan. 
Uh, Beth has experience with one of these plans, at least one of these plans in her past lives. So I'd like her to speak to that. And our costs are quite a bit higher uh, than what BHFA and the other two utilities are proposing. So we would actually be losing, as I recall, $8,000 yes. left a year. But hey, you can get into the details of that. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll give you the floor on wrap. Go ahead. Okay. So part of what I'm looking at is my experience is I have administered a type of program before. It was with TVA, so it's a government entity, where the entity funded the program directly to the customer and the utility was just the flow, supposed to be just the flow through for billing. So I've, ha I've got some experience that I'm basing some of my uh, calculations on. Our, I believe our numbers are coming, first of all, let me say the other three that are participating as of right now are a GMT, BEC and Ludlow. And those are the only ones that are opting in right now. Um, so they came in, with some numbers that were significantly lower than Hardwick's. And the main component that we have decided, we have calculated is higher than theirs is the monthly administration fee. The other three and what, and what this uh, RAP program wants to pay is 350 a month. Um, based on my experience and what the details can involve in a monthly process, doing the reconciling, doing adjustments, it's, it's not just billing it. That's an easy part. Put it on the bill, send it out, that's easy. That, I can see 350. The other components that I feel like are not being considered by the other utilities and why I think ours is higher is because there's so many variables that can come into play. Um, for instance, they say, um, if, if a customer doesn't pay one month, they're gonna forgive it. Well, that's gonna be on our end. We need to know when to forgive it, how much to forgive, keep track of how much is forgiven. Um, just, we're gonna to have to manually look at all these accounts every month to see did, how much did we bill them? Does any of it supposed to be forgiven? How much did we return to the state, keeping a record of it? And then also processing a payment to the state. We have to keep track of it. We have to give them information, but then we have to run it through our payables, which involves a second person. So it's real. It's really, it can be time intensive. Um, I don't think it's gonna be as simple as the state thinks it is. I have no problem administering it. I'm happy to do it, but our costs are gonna be about 10,000 for the life of the program. Um, how, how long, how long, can I interrupt you? How long is the program for? Um, the loans can be anywhere. They said they expect few loans, less than seven, but some can be up to 15 years. And you're saying $10,000 over the 15 year period? I'm or sorry, eight, I'm sorry, I misspoke. $8,000. I estimate, I just did an estimate. Let's say we had 10 loans at just an average of 10 years. And just over that 10 years, we would be about $8,000 short from what the RAP program. Over a 10 year period. Yes. So yes. $800 a year. Yes, roughly, yes. I can't get, I mean, we have more noise in, in, in the budget and everything else than, I mean, if, if this is something that uh, can help some of our customers and we get some good PR from it to boot, uh, because we are helping our customers, that seems to me to be a pretty small price to pay. So I, <clears throat> Beth was speaking with the administrator at BHFA and went over many of her concerns, which met with uh, deaf silence on the other end of the phone because they haven't even thought about these scenarios that she was rattling off two and three at a time. Um, so, what if that number, Lynn, was double that? If it was 1600 bucks a year, would you still feel the same way? And if you would, that's great. That's what we need to yeah. hear from all of you. Yeah. And, and you know, I think it's, also, it's also in proportion to the amount of help our ratepayers are getting. So if there's a whole bunch of money that's 
coming into our ratepayers and helping them and 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 the proportion that is burdened it's on us then it makes sense you know there's a very small amount of money and a lot of costs and it will be feeling pinched but it feels like we should yeah we should lean in as long as you can keep it in that zone and we keep watching to make sure it's a real program with real money but it's my understanding <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Roger. Okay. Uh, my understanding was that so long as we can back up the costs, we can charge those costs as part of the program. Is that incorrect? That is what the that is what the plan was, but they have locked in. Um, I think primarily, actually, I know primarily from GMP offering that rate, and then BEC saying, "Oh, we can do it for that too." And Ludlow, the municipality in Ludlow is a very well off, uh, you know, highfalutin ski area serving utility. And, you know, a few bucks to them is pretty simple. But for us, you know, I, wa I want you guys to know what it is. And I want you to tell us what you want us to do with this. This is a policy thing and it's your baby. So, so I'm sorry. So just to make sure that I understand, you're saying that that they're now saying, no, you can't justify the cost. This is what we're going to pay for everybody. Right. We told them, well, we understand your uh, initiation fee, which is a $75 application. And we said we could actually do it for less than that. But our administration fee is going to be almost three times what you want us to do. But we would be getting the $75 application fee also. We're not yes. going to charge less. Yes. Oh, yes. They're yes, doing yes. a standard Correct. rate for everybody. We yes, that's there. what they want. They want a Correct. one flat deal. Yep. And when you're talking about costs, you're not talking so much about out-of-pocket costs as putting a value on people's time. Absolutely, yes. Because we're not talking about so much that you're going to have to go out and hire another person. No. So it, it, no. to some extent, this is not even if it is more, it's, it's, it's hassle and annoyance, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not actually additional ratepayer dollars. And I, I personally have no problem administering it. I just wanted the board to be aware Absolutely. of what the cost right. is. That's, that's where we're at. We Absolutely. Just want that's you to what we wanted you to, that's exactly what we wanted <laughs> you to do. That's fine. I think we should Perfect. do it personally. Okay, so um, I they have. We need, do we need a motion here? Actually, I do, Lynn, because the um, they have a proposed tariff that everybody's signing on to. It's very generic. It includes these the initiation rate and the monthly fee, uh, and there's an agreement for us to sign with the HFA as well. So there's two documents I'm going to need to process. And they want to file the tariff this week. They just had a conference call on it today. And they want to file the tariffs this week. My, my only concern in this, I mean, the place where we could go out of pocket is if it's not ironclad, that if somebody defaults, we don't get left holding the default. That's VA, you know, that's VHFA. And so long as that's ironclad. That's ironclad. Yeah. Can't hear you, Roger. I'd like to propose that I move that we empower Mike to sign the the the, the VHFA documents and, and engage us. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Vince, did you want to? No, no, I just thought I said go aye. Oh, yeah, sure we, haven't, we haven't quite gotten there. <laughs> All in favor? <laughs> Very enthusiastic. Hi. Right. Um, <laughs> it okay. passes unanimously. Okay, great. And thanks for your work on that, Beth. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay, that takes us to the general manager's report. Trucks look great. Wow, oh, I was so happy. Can't tell you. I saw Trevor at Pool and Lumber and the I think it was an F two fifty or something and all rigged out with lights. I thought I didn't think we had any trucks that looked like that. Yeah. <laughs> Until I looks read your good, report. Yeah. Yeah, it looks yeah. great. 
So no kidding, uh, Friday, you know, the trucks are here and the meter readers truck is just waiting for the new catalytic converter to come in, which is coming tomorrow. Can't, can't hear you again, Mike. Oh, sorry. Am I muted? Can you hear me now? Yep. 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 So literally on Friday, the meter reader came into my office and said, I got some bad news. I said, what? He says, the transmission just blew up in my pickup. And I said, well, your, your new one will be ready to be there Wednesday. So you can find it out. <laughs> So do we have do we have budget for this fence? For what? You, oh, you, the new fence. fence. <laughs> no, that's, that's probably thirty thousand plus to fence that yard. Ouch. So what are what we're doing right now? Uh, Ken Santamore is like Mister Security, whether it be internet or FERC requirements or whatever, and he has a good relationship with a camera company in Burlington, and after the last uh, vandalism we had at Wolcott, they put together a package for a camera system down there that we're going to tie into the fiber, Velcro fiber system. The Velcro fiber also goes to the Hardwick substation at the warehouse. So we're going to put a camera system in there too. I'm just- Yeah, but a, cam a camera there. system helps you maybe after, <laughs> after the fact apprehending somebody. It doesn't stop it from happening in the first I, place. I agree. And if we're losing copper and we're having people vandalizing trucks, either things have to be locked up in the building or or we need a oh. serious fence. <laughs> in the in the meantime, though, if you get the cameras, the signs that say video oh, surveillance, the signs you, oh, yeah. those actually do prevent a well, lot of I agree. people using put dummy videos. cameras up too, those and, yeah. and put up a sign. What, what kind of security do we have in the office? Do we have anything? Security system? No. We don't the security anything. system or cameras or a, we probably should have no. something in there. That's the, that's the next spot to go. Seems like they're just hitting everything we have. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't disagree with you, Mike. Um, so At we, least a sign on the door, camera protected. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then get uh, the camera. Smile, you're on camera. Yeah, I'm fine with something like that, you know, ev evasive actions, but. We do try and limit our exposure there. Really all we have in there on any given day is $300 or less in cash and the computer system. Right. right. Which, you know, somebody went in there and put a hammer through our servers, we'd be in deep trouble. But if they did that, we're on a how many hour recovery now with SCDC, Beth? I don't remember. Um, they can have a whole new server on site in 48 hours. 48 hours. So it's all backed up. It's and, a yes. Yeah, we do have daily backups, but we also have a contract with SEDC for the actual physical server. Okay. They can get us one in 48 hours. So the daily backup. About a, year, about, a, about a year ago, we had a server, uh, the UPS system in the server failed. And I jury rigged everything together and got it going while we ordered a new one. And uh, that's when we started looking at, well, what happens if? And Beth found out about their service plan with SEDC that we didn't have. So we've executed that and now we have this 48 hour. Contract. And they're actually backing up our data every day as well. It's, it's not a real time. It's, it's just actually operating on a local server. It's not on their server. Correct. Right. Okay, so it's a daily backup rather than real time. That was, a, we, that was an intention of, of going with SEDC to have our own servers where Eventually, when we have an outage management system or other support systems that link with our customer information system, we have a generator right there at the at the office, and we can run an island and have all our systems fully functional. Right. Uh, whether the grid's up or they're up, or their systems are up or down, we'll be on our own running fine. Yeah. The other the other uh, <coughs> the other possibility is having a mirror server on site, you know, behind just ethernet connected. Yeah, yeah, it's a little, it's a little bit of money, <laughs> but it is, you know, like a guaranteed, then you have it immediately and- Yeah, no, you're right. Time. So we pay, I think we pay $300 a month, Beth, for the back 48 hour backup. Does that sound right? I think it's 30, 300 bucks yeah. a month. Yeah. And the server system that we have in the basement was over 30 grand and that was, six or seven years ago. So I don't know what it would cost to put in a new one today, but more than 30 grand.
seems high. Okay. Um, I'm going to suggest that we go to other business um, before the executive session, because then we can just close things out with the executive session. Yeah, the executive session will be about one minute. Good. Did you want to do the executive session now? It's up to you. We, we, can, we can stick with it. Then we have it on tape when we came back on. That's a good idea. <laughs> That's a really good idea. <laughs> I like that a lot. Okay. It's four weeks. <laughs> All right. Um, I am going to move that we go into executive session to discuss a confidential employee matter. Um, Roger seconded it. Um, any opposition? Hearing none, it is at it is 7.41 p.m. and we are going into executive session. So the recording needs to go off. Okay. It is 7.44 p.m. We are out of executive session. No action was taken, uh, which takes us to other business. Um, one of the items is, um, do we want to continue having meetings on Zoom or do we want to resume meeting in person? I like Zoom. I would do it some more. Any other? I'm, okay. I'm open to either. Yeah, doesn't matter to me. Yeah, I, th I think we need to, if we have in person, we need to have hybrid like Zoom available at least. Well, I, I'm not sure that I agree on, on that, but, but in any case, it sounds like the consensus, it sounds like there's one strong preference for staying on, on, on Zoom and others don't care much, so. Not, not strong preference as much as strong voice. Yeah, and I, I would say, <laughs> I wouldn't say I don't have a strong preference. I, I, I think we need both. We let, why don't, Lynn, why don't we ask the question every month and- Yeah, yeah, no, we can, we can raise it. I mean, I think, I think we do lose something by meeting on Zoom. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and having, you know, even especially when we have presentations or other things, but uh, I, I just wanted to, to put it out there. So um, it sounds like we stay the course, at least for next month. Um, and Mike, I can't remember what the other item was. The other one was you wanted to take a harder look at Eli's report. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. And unfortunately, Eli isn't on anymore. Um, yeah, if you have some questions, I can get them to him and yeah, have him respond. Yeah, at least from my vantage point, um, I wondered what, what the discussion was on the moratorium on utility shutoffs on that proceeding. Okay. I mean, it might, it would be helpful if we had a little bit more meat on the bones, not just a headline, but a, a, a little something that told us. So why don't I just get meat on the bones on every item on the list? But, but I think the, at least the ones that I was interested in was that was the orders on appointment of the energy efficiency utilities and um, the renewable energy compliance standard. Okay. On compliance for 2021, just to see how we were doing on that, at least as far as the PUC was concerned. Okay. I don't know if others, I mean, if, if people want to see all of them, that's, 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 that's fine. But that was, oh, that was interesting. Piece of cake. So, and if, if you, if you get that, just, I think just send it out to us, you yep. know, and, and yep. I, I guess the other thing is, is that when things come up, if Eli can send something and send it, it doesn't have to wait till there's going to be a board meeting. I mean, especially if there's something um, that you know has some time Pressing. issues with it. Yep. So um, anyhow, that was that was. Does anyone have anything else? I was just going to mention that um, I saw Paul Fix this weekend. He said that the select board have determined where the ARPA funds are going to go. And uh, I can't remember the, the amount, but a lot are going to go to uh, increasing fiber availability in Hardwick and surrounding areas. And that will require some taller, what Mike calls 
power poles. Most people would call them telephone poles uh, because in order to get another line of fiber, you've got to have a height of, in any case. So that's something that's going to be coming down the, the road. And uh, obviously we get paid for it from ARPA and I don't know what the timing will be. Yeah, that's all called uh, make ready work. Yeah. So, make ready work? Yep, that's called make ready. Make it ready for another entity to join the pole right. line. So we have to have X number of inches between us and fiber, X number of inches between yeah. us and telephone. So yeah, a lot of times it requires taller poles. Yeah, he said 18 inches and stuff, yeah. yeah. So in any case, it'll be a good bit of work and it'll take time, but at least uh, the funding is apparently set. There's some we'll funding. Take it. Paul, Paul spoke to me also, um, and there's there's some funding. I don't know that it's going to cover. Ah, because um, I don't think they I don't think they or we know what the costs are. But they've they've gotten an allocation of part of the ARPA funds from right. the town of Hardwick. Um, but um, yeah, a lot of the issue, believe it or not, with that comes in with the tree trimming. They don't, they don't think about that. Tree trim is, is expensive. And if we go up with a five foot or 10 foot higher pole, that usually incorporates a lot more trimming. Well, somebody may have to decide to do some poles and not others. Yeah. And you can, you can dig, dig around the pole so it's effectively lower. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Bury the tree. <laughs> okay. Is there any other business? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? One thing, uh, Beth just cornered me on a text here and said we didn't approve the minutes, previous minutes. Oh, we didn't? No. Nope. Oh dear, I okay. skipped that, sorry. Yeah, because Eric came in and I just, thank you, Beth. <laughs> okay. We have minutes from the uh, May 16th meeting. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Yeah. Any opposition? Hearing none, those minutes are approved. Uh, and we have minutes from the uh, June 20th meeting. Second. Is there a motion? I move to approve those minutes. Second. I didn't, I didn't okay. see them. Any objection? Hearing none, those minutes are approved. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Did we, did we have them? Did we, we, did we vote oh. to adjourn? No, no, I don't think we did. Uh, there was a motion to adjourn. There was a second, I, I think. Who's going to vote against that one? <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I just want to stare at you guys. <laughs> um, Liam, did really you make hungry. that motion? I did not make that motion. Who did? I did. Uh, Roger. Roger did. And I, I second. Think, and I, and, and Thank Mike you. Did. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 This meeting is adjourned at 7. That was a good meeting. Awesome. Bye. Very cool. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.